Good morning. Today is 15 January, the year 2010. I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, the, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the study of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. Today, I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteer Dr. Jack Herlin, and today we have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Rena Schlauer Schulten. <laughs> Ms. Shulton was born in Tanganyika in 1943 of parents who fled Germany in 1937. So we're going to talk to her about her parents uh, and their involvement in World War II and prior to World War II and also about herself and her, uh, uh, her life as well. Rena, so good to have you here there. Thank you. Okay. Now, we're going to do this... Uh, Oh, good. I don't have to look at myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get you lined up here. Okay, that looks pretty good. So, we're going to kind of be a... Uh, Thanks, Jack. I put some of the stuff out there. Right there. Oh, okay, that's my clothes. Okay. <laughs> so, Re <laughs> Rena, first of all, uh, would you uh, pronounce and spell uh, your full name for us, please? Uh, Rena, R E N A, then Mariana, M A R R I A N N A, last name Scholten, S H O L T O N. And uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Dar es Salaam, September 5, sorry, Dar es Salaam, Tanganyika, September 5, 1943. And um, now your father, what was his uh, name? Could you spell his uh, full name too? First name, Erwin, E-R-W-I-N, middle name, James, J-A-M-E-S, and last name, Schlahauer, S-C-H, L O C H A U E R. Okay. And when and where was he born? He was born in Berlin, September 15th, 1915. And what did his father do? His father owned the second largest cigarette factory in all of Germany. What was his name? His name was Arnold Schlahauer. And uh, their uh, their background. Did their families always live in Germany, or yes? Mm -hmm. okay. And can you trace in, back how far uh, your you know, uh, ancestors went? To let's see, it would be. I don't have I don't have that uh, to to be added. No, okay. <laughs> it's somewhere. Is it like a couple hundred years or it's more? East, it was East Prussia. Because the, uh, the Germans were all broken up into different kingdoms, mm -hmm. right, uh, principalities, and uh, and then uh, I've forgotten who brought them together, but somehow they united and became Germany. I see. Um, and your mother, what was her name and her maiden name? My mother's uh, name, Mariana, and her maiden name, Gergely, G-E-R-G-L-Y, and that would be a Ukrainian name. And my mother was born in, um, actually at the time of her birth, which was 19, uh, 16, 17, uh, would have been the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. But as a result of World War I and the remaking of the European map, it became Czechoslovakia. And so she grew up in a town called Berahovo, Czechoslovakia. But she maintained her pride in being a Ukrainian. So she was considered a white Russian? White Russian, yes. That's what she always said she was. <laughs> As opposed to the red Russians. Right. And well, when she was born in Czechoslovakia, or 
How long did she live in Czech? Did she grow up in Czechoslovakia? Yeah, grew up and uh, left uh, in 19... Uh, if I can look at my paper here. Sure. I think... <coughs> okay, 1939, her father, who was uh, very politically uh, busy, uh, and he was for the, the, uh, the um, independence of the Ukraine. So the Red Russians didn't care for him. The, the, the Nazis were coming in anyhow, taking over parts of the Czechoslovakia. So in 39, my, my grandfather sent her out to uh, Greece to join her sister and brother-in-law, who were at that time uh, nightclub entertainers. <coughs> but I want to back up just a little bit. Uh, when she was growing up in Czechoslovakia, were they under the control of the, the Red Russians? Or, no, or they, they had their own yeah. deal? And what did her father do? Father was the superintendent of schools in the district in which they lived. And what was the town? Okay. Berahovo. How do you spell that? My dear. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> We're going to get that later. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so when she left in 39, uh, you said she was an entertainer. Had she been an no. entertainer all her life or what? No, uh, she was in convent school to learn either to be a teacher or a nurse. There's a, a confusion between what my father says and what my, my mother told me as a child. I understood she was uh, trained to be a nurse. Um, so she, she ended up in uh, Athens where Irmush, my aunt, or Irma, and uh, my uncle George were nightclub entertainers. And she was sitting in the, just in a hotel room and, and doing nothing while they they rehearsed and did their performances and after about a month or so she had enough of that and she said uh, that she wants to go home that this is not no life to sit in this miserable hotel room and wait and so uh, George said you know at this point it's impossible for you to return but I hear that you and, and Irma when you sing quietly together you harmonize very nicely so what you what I propose you do is to sew some uh, costume folk costumes uh, Ukrainian folk costumes. I'll teach the band to accompany you, and you go on the stage, and the two of you will sing a couple of songs, and you'll get paid. And there you're not sitting in a hotel room and being bored. And, and my mother then tells me the story. She said, "Renushka, we went on the stage. We were so popular." George almost lost his job. <laughs> so the duo got, and the stage name for my aunt and uncle were Gabor, which is a very common Hungarian name. It's like Smith in America. And uh, they, uh, they were the duo Gabor, the two Gabors. And the duo, then, he, then my uncle taught my mother a few dance steps and included her in the rest of the act. And the duo Gabor became the trio Gabor. And they went all over the Middle East, uh, especially after the war broke out. Uh, they performed in Syria, Lebanon, um, Palestine, Iraq, Iran, and uh, and they entertained the British troops as, as well. Oh, also Egypt. I mm -hmm. neglected that one. Uh, and so they, she both sang and danced then. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see her perform? Yourself? Uh, <laughs> only at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the the songs were they more folk more folk songs that they sang, or did they sing popular songs no, they, too? Yeah, they did popular things. It, it, whatever was was popular at the time. Time. There's a funny thing is Alexander's Ragtime Band. Mm -hmm. For some reason, my mother decided it was always McNamara's Ragtime Band, <laughs> and she sang phonetically because she didn't speak English. My uncle Georgie spoke English. Uh, I think maybe Aunt Irma spoke a little bit, but uh, my mother only, when she came out of Czechoslovakia, only spoke Russian, Czech, Polish, all the Slavic languages, and my Uncle George tried to teach her to speak French because that was the international language at the time. And after three weeks, he threw the book down. He said, you're so fantastically stupid, you're only going to speak these uh, Slavic languages. And then she met another entertainer in the troupe, 
was a French woman, and sat with her and by ear picked up French. And this is what she did for the rest of her life is she would pick, pick up languages. Uh, the same thing with the, with the singing and the music. There was nothing written down, everything by ear. And uh, when she passed away in 1992, she spoke 10 languages. <laughs> <laughs> so McNamara's ragtime band, come yes. along, come along, yeah. <laughs> let me take you to the band. Come uh, on a here, come on a here was on her version. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> the, leader of the, the thing is, my Uncle George, uh, he was quite the wheeler dealer, and he cooked up a scheme with these nightclub owners that uh, after the performances, that the two girls would go and sit in the audience with the with the customers, and uh, the customers were served uh, alcohol, and the girls were served tea. But the customer paid for an alcoholic drink, <laughs> and my mother, she resented that, that. But she was 19 years old, and she was they had to do with what she was told. Now to was do. that her brother and her sister? It's a brother-in-law and brother. sister. Oh, sister yeah. and her and husband and. Yeah, Uncle George was a very strong-minded man, and and where was where was he from? He was Hungarian. He was Hungarian. Born mm -hmm. born and raised in Budapest. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, then, and where did he meet your uh, her your mom's sister? My mother, uh, my mother's sister, was always interested in dance, and in um, barracks has Czechoslovakia. There is a big dancing school and and theater was. Uh, Good cultural center in, in the 30s. And so Ermush went and performed and all this. But the the big place to go was Paris, London, Berlin, Budapest. Mm -hmm. So Budapest is closest. She went and uh, found the job with the ballet company and George uh, uh, Gabor, who was uh, born Gladstein, uh, was the ballet master. And so, there you are. <laughs> you you meet the people you work with. <laughs> you know, you marry the people you and, work with. And uh, what religion was 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 your mom? Her my mother, uh, my mother, and her family were uh, Eastern Orthodox. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the czar was the head of the church for them. Right. And uh, now the uh, Czechoslovakians people, for the most part. What did they think of the Nazis and them coming in, taking over their country, etc.? Oh dear, um, it, it was it was fear, of course. Uh, the Sudetenland, uh, they were perfectly happy that they were because they were cons they considered themselves Germans, uh, but tremendous fear from both the Red Russians and from the Germans. This is not that it was not a good thing that was going to happen to them, yeah. and they knew it. Uh, that's why my grandfather sent my, my mother out. Because she was such an attractive uh, young woman, he said, either or, this is going to be a war zone and it's not going to be pleasant for her. So, Going back to your dad's family now, um, so his, his father had this cigarette company, right? Correct. And, uh, and so your dad grew up in Berlin, did he? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And mm -hmm. Did he ever talk about what he did as a kid and, you know, that's, uh, yeah. what, what kids do and stuff like that? Right. Uh, he is a twin. And uh, there were, my grandfather had, it was the second largest cigarette factory in all of Germany. And uh, after World War I, World War I, uh, the cigarette was considered an essential uh, material to be given to the soldiers. <laughs> right? So the business blossomed and, th and they were fantastically wealthy and they, uh, I know he told me li they lived in a villa, they had a uh, chauffeur, they had several maids in the household, uh, tutors if their grades were not absolutely perfect in school, a tutor was brought in to improve the grades. They had, they even had the light middleweight champion boxer of Germany come in to give the boys when they were teenagers boxing lessons mm -hmm. and they had athletic uh, coaches. The, the land on which this villa uh, was situated had a park yard, <laughs> but it's a, it was a park. Uh, and they had a race course on there for the bicycle racing and uh, 
There was a pond in, in the front entrance of the property that when in 1920s when the film companies wanted to a scene with a lake, they came and they filmed it in this <laughs> pond. <Aww. laughs> and they had motorcycles and, and things like that and uh, traveled tremendously uh, all over Europe uh, and, and in all the best resorts of Germany. And they considered themselves Germans. And my grandfather had by, uh, well, he fell in love by chance with a titled uh, German young woman. And when he, when she married him, her family disowned her. But then when the cigarette company came to be so successful and my grandfather became a, a wealthy, prominent German <laughs> citizen, all of a sudden Arnold was okay <laughs> in their eyes. And what about religious background for that family? Uh, well, it's, uh, my grandfather was uh, from a Jewish family. He was not uh, practicing uh, Jewish. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, the German Jews consider themselves more German rather than uh, Jewish. There was um, maybe socially they were discriminated against. Uh, you couldn't join certain clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you couldn't go to certain hotels. But otherwise, their life was uh, was magnificent. It was uh, uh -huh. unbelievable wealth. Now, the, the Depression, I know it was bad over here, but I think it was much worse in Germany. How did that affect the family? And also, did the Depression hit Czechoslovakia as well? Okay. Um, I'm more uh, aware of what w went on with Germany than with Czechoslovakia. My mother wasn't that much. Uh, she talked about her antics as a child, and that was about it. <laughs> Mostly she talked about her show business stuff. <laughs> Uh, all right, so the World War I ends, comes the Versailles Treaty, and of course the Germans have lost, and they are going to pay reparations, and the Allies really hit them uh, with these reparations. And there was no thing like the Marshall Plan after World War II, where you try to help a country get back on its feet. Uh, so Germany went into a deep depression because of this, uh, all these reparations that they were forced to pay. Uh, and I believe that the depression of the 1920s, which were in, starting in Germany, then spread to the depression worldwide in the 1930s. And we talked to a historian how, about how that affected the start of World War II. Oh, well, I know. <laughs> right. So, but how did that affect your that hit your dad's family, or did yeah, it? Yeah, it didn't. It didn't. Uh, they still were uh, living the good life. Um, I, I know there is a story where uh, they had to get uh, several times a day men from this uh, cigarette company, uh, which by the way uh, uh, employed about 3,500 people, um, with wheelbarrows to go to the stores to pick up the money, because the money, the, the uh, Deutsche Mark went from, I, I have it written down, it's, uh, if I can look for a moment. Um, <coughs> oh, the numbers. Oh. I, I, uh, wait a minute. You can edit this thing, right? Oh. <laughs> oh, here we go. 1922 to 1923, the Deutsche Mark went from one million, it turned into one, one like one dollar, was worth one dollar. So they were carrying wheelbarrows out of the, sure. the stores. My grandfather was obliged to pay the employees twice a day because the money was uh, so worthless. Yeah. Yeah. But he, t he managed to keep his company going and keep his employees intact and, and, and paid. So when the, um, when the uh, Hitler and his group st came along, how did your family view that uh, initially? Well, initially, all right, let's go it's from uh, it, where I'm starting to hear about it uh, when they're talking years is 1929. It's now uh, the the brown shirts are, are around and and the black shirts. They were two, the black shirts were the SS and the SA, 
were the the army kind of division or anyhow uh, the and this anti-semitism was going on was starting to 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 blossom hitler found the ones he was going to pick on, the minority. And there were uh, perhaps uh, one million German Jews living in Germany at the time. And uh, the first pro uh, thing that they came up against is that my grandfather's prominence and his wealth was a target. And the Nazis supported another cigarette company Rumpsdam or something like that. I can't. I have to look on the paper to to say how to pronounce it correctly. And what was the name of your Masari? It was Masari cigarettes, and uh, and his. Uh, I'm sorry. I I forget that my grandfather has three sisters and a brother. Uh, his brother Bruno, and he were in the cigarette business together, and when the sisters married, the husbands were then. Uh, Either they weren't brought into the company, but they were given enough money to start their own companies, cigar manufacturing, everything with, uh, had to do with tobacco. And they lived very well, and my grandfather subsidized them as well. By the way, where did they get their tobacco? I have no idea. But I don't, I don't, yeah, it's a question, isn't it? That would be a question. Um, but, um, all right, so in 1929, the Nazis are supporting this other cigarette company. This other cigarette company always wanted to buy my grandfather out, and there was some sort of pressure. I don't know what was brought about, but he sold, it kind of was understood that he should sell his company to this other cigarette company, and uh, things will be okay. They made him an offer he could not refuse. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So he sold, and uh, and they he was paid in all cash, fifty million dollars. So nineteen twenty nine thirty, it becomes my my family, my father's family, could not believe that people are taking this guy Hitler uh, seriously. You know, and he wasn't in power yet. He was making his moves, and, and they said, "This is silly. You know, it's not going to happen. There, no, no one's going to uh, to make this man a head of a country, and things will improve. This is just a, a, a small interruption in their lives." Now, my grandfather's brother Bruno <laughs> was not that. Uh, he also was hoping for the best, but he was a little bit more. Uh, uh, maybe it realized sooner that things were not going to get better. And he took his money and sent it out, out of the country. My grandfather, uh, of course, has all this money on his hands, so he said, well, let's send some to Holland just in case something does happen. And he did. They, they were going to send it to Switzerland. I don't know what stopped that. But the money, some, uh, s uh, several million went to Holland. And uh, as we know, it would have been uh, lost anyway. But then uh, uh, as things progressed and people needed to, uh, I'm getting way ahead of myself, by uh, so 2933 you're living in hope that Hitler's not going to come to power. 1933 January Hitler does come in power and the Kaiser runs to Holland. <laughs> and uh, so now it's like okay no one's going to re-elect this man. This, this is going to pass. This cannot, Germany cannot uh, fall under the influence of this, this uh, man. And so anyhow, they, uh, and again, my grandfather's prominence comes into play. And so they said, all right, let's uh, 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 leave the villa uh, and we will move to an apartment and we will keep a low profile. And things will, things will change. This cannot happen. This cannot. They would not believe that what was going to happen was going to happen. They kept living on this hope. And uh, by 1937, of course, it was not bad. And money had to be brought back into Holland, uh, from Holland, to get the family out of Germany. And that's what my grandfather. He was the last Schlahar to leave Germany in 19. Uh, thir late 37 and they went to Italy 
they went uh, to... Uh, was it difficult to get out? Uh, no, they could leave, but they couldn't take... Uh, I think they were limited to $5 U.S. Mm. <laughs> and I, I don't know how, it, how this money uh, left, uh, left Germany to put the boys through universities and things. But my father went to England to university. His twin brother went to Geneva to university. And uh, the money could not uh, go to, at, at one point, the money couldn't go to, to England anymore, so my father uh, came, uh, went to Paris to continue his engineering, his studies, but he couldn't complete his studies there either. Was your father in the Hitler Youth? No, 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 no. I, I, I no. talked to, um, originally, I mean, early on, it was considered, it was almost like the YMCA, pretty much all the they were all in it, even the Jewish, there were some Jewish boys that yeah. were in it. It was more of a... Uh, yeah. Uh, in school, uh, they, uh, I, I recall now that there was like 50% of the class joined the Hitler Youth, but yeah. no. no. But, uh, the, the, uh, the Nuremberg Laws were 35, 1935, is it? Uh, I'm not sure. What were those laws, probably? Okay, that's, those are the uh, anti-discrimination uh, laws f uh, for the Jews. Could not own business, could not uh, go, to, go to certain restaurants, could not uh, do a lot of things, could not attend school, not allowed to attend school, could not marry. Uh, oh, the uh, Aryans could, should not uh, fraternize or marry the Jews because there was some uh, legal penalties. I think you mentioned a little earlier that at least some of the German Jews didn't take kindly to the other European Jews coming into Germany. Right. So again, in the 1920s, the Russians, who were anti-Semitic, were doing the, well, it's prior to then, it's, we go into history, back into history, they, the, the, the Jews were always picked on. And uh, the Ru every once in a while, the Russians would, uh, would do these pogroms, and the, the Polish would also pogroms to clean out the ghettos and they pushed the Polish and Russian Jews into Germany and the German Jews said here come the, these guys arrive they had they were not well educated they were not uh, culturally elite as the German Jews were and they spoke a terrible German which is called Yiddish and my uncle Bernard actually says that this Yiddish hurt the German German's ears because it sounded so awful. And he said, if this hadn't happened, if they weren't, uh, these immigrants hadn't come into Germany, that this this business of the German, of the, uh, the, the Jews being picked on in Germany and being faulted for the loss of World War I and the depression wouldn't have occurred. And I don't, I, I don't, my father didn't believe that and I, I don't think so. I, actually am stunned at my uncle's <laughs> reaction. And when I read it for the first time in a paper that he wrote in, 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 in the 1980s, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, so they, uh, they got to Italy when they got out? They left the, uh, the entire family. So it's the uh, parents, the two boys, uh, and uh, two sisters. And uh, Mussolini was no no problem. Uh, my uncle Bruno had a hotel in Trieste on the Adriatic coast. It's about 350 rooms or so. And a lovely resort place, and they went there. And then uh, they said, well, we cannot sit on this man's neck. And the two boys went to Milan and found work. And then my uncle Bernard came up with a brilliant idea somehow he took some time off from school and went back to Berlin and learned uh, how to cut cloth for uh, clothing, for suits and things. And so he went into the uh, uh, pants and uh, shirt business, uh, suit business Taylor. in Milan. Taylor. Pardon? Taylor. Taylor, that's it, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and he hired people. I mean, he taught them how to cut the cloth and all this, and, and, and they. And he went in his car from store to store and peddled his suits, and it was growing into a nice little business. 
Who and was that now? That was my Uncle Baron, my, my father's twin brother. Oh, you twin and my father, in the meantime, went as um, a translator for a, a radio company in Italy. Um, and um, so things were going along fine until Hitler made a visit in 19, uh, early 1939 to Mussolini and said, make mutual aid and you will need to get rid of your Jews or will, you know, things will be done. And so Mussolini turned around and said, could you please, in the next six months, please leave the country. Now, now we have the problem of, uh, to get out of Italy, uh, they went to, of course, to different embassies and attempted to go somewhere. And uh, because there's a depression all over the world, the countries are having unemployment problems so many countries denied them entry. I mean, everywhere they tried, they were denied entry. And my father, they had divided the embassies in half. So each boy, each uh, brother went to a different embassy to try to, to get visas. And my father was coming out of the British embassy after being told that chances don't look so good, and literally bumped into a fellow schoolmate from London, uh, from the uh, King's College in London. And the guy says, Schlauer, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm trying to get out of this country, I'm trying to get me and my family out of this country. And he said, I, no one won. We can't get visas for anywhere. And the guy said, well, I'm, I'm the, uh, I don't know what, uh, I want to say adjutant, but that's not the correct uh, for the diplomatic service. But anyway, he was an assistant to the British ambassador to Italy. And he said, listen, I can get you to Cyprus if you have a visa to continue to another country, all right? And my father said, well, okay, we're stuck. And he goes, no, you're not. He said, the Japanese have invaded China and the Chinese ambassador to Italy is not going back. But to make money, he is selling visas to Shanghai. So <laughs> go to him. And so my father did. He went and he bought six visas to go to Shanghai. And the then went back to his friend at the British Embassy and they got their visas and they left in the spring of 39, they went to Cyprus. And, but they were obliged by September 23rd, 1939, to then leave Cyprus and go to Shanghai, unless they could find something else in, in, while they were in Cyprus, somewhere else to go, some other way to, to get to a more, uh, not, not to go to China. And uh, my father then says, uh, in Cyprus, he found job uh, as a um, uh, working with two other fellows with seismograph with a station wagon that had seismograph machinery on it, and they were searching for water for the Brits. Again, this is a territory of the British. Uh, Cyprus. Now, has he met your mother at this point yet? No. Meanwhile, she's in the neighborhood, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so. Um, he has that job. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what his brother was doing, but I'm, I know his brother had work, and uh, my father was being paid $100 a month, and Bernard was only being paid $90 a month, so there was this <laughs> competition between the two of them. And, but they were supporting their family. And uh, the British every once, uh, once in a while would pick up the foreign aliens and uh, put them into, a, well, they kind of put them in a nice, prison kind of thing. But I mean, they weren't locked up in cells or anything, but they had to be cleared to make sure that they weren't spying for the, for the Germans or the, the Axis powers. And um, during a three-week period when my father uh, had been taken into one of these holding areas, he, at that time, unbeknownst to him, actually ran into this Hungarian nightclub entertainer who said, you must come to the nightclub when we get out of here and see my, my sister and sister-in-law in our act. <laughs> and my father said, we didn't mingle with the artists in those days. <laughs> you know, he still had this, this German snobbishness about him, you know. And he said, I don't know why this man even speaks to me. Well, in, a, in about, uh, let's see, so 39, so by 19, uh, in another two years, another three, maybe three years, they're going to be in-laws. <laughs> but they didn't know it at the time. <laughs> and um, anyhow, so now 
it's uh, beginning of September, and uh, so they said, well, in three weeks, you know, we better start thinking about packing up and we're going to Shanghai because we can't, they could not find another country to take them. And then as, uh, my fa as my father put it, he said, as luck would have it, the British declared war on the Germans on, on September 1st, 1939, and he said, and we automatically, because we were, we were uh, uh, alien, uh, ref uh, in danger, because of uh, being Jewish, that the British took them under their, their wing. May I segue to my mother's story at that time in sure. Cyprus? Yes. Okay, so she is entertaining in Nicosia and everywhere in the, in the nightclubs. And of course, the war, the British declare war. My uncle, who was Gladstein, uh, also known as Gabor, he and his wife go under the wing of the British because they are Jewish aliens. But my mother is a single Christian woman. I mean, not, uh, the, the, you know, Catholic. So uh, the, everyone's going to be evacuated at some point. And, um, it's a couple of months down the road, but my mother is going to stay behind at the tender age of 19 or 20, you know, and who's going to look after her? So when the date comes that they're going to be put on a ship and, and evacuated, and by the way, my, my father and his, his family will be on the same ship to go to Palestine, uh, my mother, Maritza, is going to be left behind. So they make the performance the night before they're going to leave, and the two girls, uh, as I said, always went out to the audience. They sat at a table and they were crying. And the district commissioner, the Britisher, who enjoyed their uh, act, and who always came frequently to the nightclub, said to George, my uncle, said, what is the matter with the two girls? They're so sad, you know? And he said, well, Irma and I are being evacuated tomorrow, and Maritz is being left behind, and we don't know what the heck's gonna happen to her. And the district commissioner said, not to worry. He said, I will meet you at the ship and I will have a document for you and she will be able to board and go with you. And there is, in one of these uh, the papers that I have, there is the, the letter that gives her permission to leave with them. But it's, it's like a Hollywood movie, you know. It's like, you can't write stuff like this. No. <laughs> so anyhow, they all end up in, in Palestine. Now, did they meet on the ship then? Your they may have, but it, it may have been a casual thing but, again. Okay, nothing special. You know, it's again, Irwin does not mingle with <laughs> other than a certain class. <laughs> His family, I'm a split personality because my mother's very outgoing, you know. <laughs> and then there's this other side of, you know, snobbishness never ever hurt anyone. <laughs> never killed anyone. So, okay. <laughs> so... The, the, there is family in Palestine, so I guess my father's family must have stayed with them or so, but the British also told these evacuees that uh, uh, when we blow the whistle, you're, you're, you're to come back to this boat because we're going to take you somewhere else because the Arabs got a little excited with all these Jews coming in and that there's, you know, they're going to make a, a move for a, a, a Jewish state. So... Uh, I don't know how long they were in Palestine, but then they were evacuated, again, my father's family, and they were put on a ship, which ended up in Durban, South Africa, and then put on a train to take them inland to Nyasaland, because they didn't leave the aliens on the coast, because, again, there might be spies and they might be, you know, making signals to the U-boats. And uh, so they're inland. Um, there were some Italian POWs on this ship of theirs as well, and uh, they were, my father was the translator, and, uh, and uh, oh, it was a British n uh, naval ship. So they needed a, a civilian liaison man because the civilians should not fraternize with the military. And because of his ability to speak many languages, he was the translator for the Italian POWs, <laughs> and he was the civilian liaison between the civilians. But somewhere along the way, he must have slipped up on his job because the uh, ship's uh, doctor, a Britisher by the name of Percy Morell, fell in love with his sister Helga, 
And when the ship pulled into Durban, the officers made it possible for Percy to get off the ship during a four or six hour period, turnaround period, and to get Helga to the district commissioner, and they were married. And then Helga was put on a train, on this refugee train, to go to Nyaslin, and Percy got back on his Navy ship and went to war. Uh, the train ride takes 24 hours from Durban to Nyaslin. Is that in Tanganyika? No, that Nyaslin? is uh, South, uh, that was from uh, South uh, Africa. You go uh, it's between South Africa and, Tang and East Africa, so more central, uh, uh, Eastern Central Africa. And uh, when the train arrives at the station, and then they're going to be taken by truck to, to a camp, a fellow, a British uh, guy with a clipboard comes along, Mrs. Percy Morell, Mrs. Percy Morell. And of course, Helga had, did not react because she didn't, wasn't used to the name yet. <laughs> and my Uncle Bernard said, Helga, that's you, you know? And he said, here, this is, here is Mrs. Percy Morell, you know? And the fellow comes up to her and he says, Mrs. Morell, you're a British citizen and you can't be hanging around with these aliens. <laughs> so we're sending you to England. <laughs> and so and and so she took another 24-hour train ride back to Durban and she re refused to go by herself. So Baronet accompanied her. And just as well because they passed these Italian POWs who hooted and whistled at her and carried on. So. Anyhow, so they put her on a ship and she ended up in England and she arrived in the middle of the Blitz with a German accent. And Percy's family were not thrilled, <laughs> okay? And the first thing they said to her, they said, you're from Switzerland. This is how we explain your accent. And we don't understand what the hell our son did. <laughs> and so there you are. <laughs> the girls did not have much luck with their in-laws. <laughs> so... Uh, at the in Nyaslin, my father, because he had an engine, he was a mechanical engineer, uh, went to work for the British, and the first assignment he had was to build barracks for the African rifles, and these are the native uh, Africans who are inducted into the British Army. And he's not a surveyor, <laughs> he's not a construction guy, he's a mechanical engineer. You know? And I have at home a small book, How to Survey. And I have his notes, which he made every evening on what he was going to do the next day. And he surveyed the land and leveled it. And he built the barracks perfectly. And uh, there you are. Then, and now we're, we're uh, this is from 39 to 41. Uh, Bernard, in the meantime, he has discovered that um, the quota out of Tanganyika to the United States is much higher than out of Nyasalan. So he moves his uh, other sister, who is now maybe 13, 14 years old, and his parents to Dar es Salaam. And he goes to work as the scheduler for the Tanganyika railway system. And Tanganyika is a territory mandated by the League of Nations after World War I to be looked at uh, over by the British. And, uh, and my father continues to do whatever he's doing in Nyaslin. Prior, prior to World War I, was it uh, a German? Uh, was East, East, yeah, German East Africa. Right. right. And you have the African Queen uh, mm -hmm. story and Lake yeah. Tanganyika and all that, yeah. And, um, okay. So now, the next thing I hear about is, uh, this is a, the refugee camp in Nyasaland is a stone fort, and it's being manned by the British Army. And the British Army, again, cannot oversee, the military cannot oversee civilians. They always has to be a liaison man. So there is Irwin again, and he is translating for the Italian POW camp for the British there. He is, and then they have these many more civilian refugees coming, and so they, he is the liaison man between the civilians and the British Army. In amongst, on a boatload, come a troop of entertainers, 40 of them, and now the head of the group, George. <laughs> okay? 
and they arrived early December 1941. And uh, about after a couple of weeks, the camp commander said, you know, Christmas is coming up. And he said, Schlohauer, go and find out from these entertainers if they would put on a Christmas show for these other uh, poor fellows. And so my father found Gabor and said, would you put on a Christmas show? And my uncle, how many matane, how many evening performance do you want? How many days? <laughs> <laughs> One will do. <laughs> right. and so they made the performance on Christmas Eve and uh, it was all very nice. And then the, the, the British uh, commander of the camp said, as a thank you to these entertainers, for New Year's Eve, we're going to have a dinner dance party, and we're going to have the British dignitaries from the uh, neighboring uh, town come, and so on and so forth. And I bring this up because this is where my parents will actually meet. Uh, my mother, of course, has seen this guy around the camp, and her roommate in her, her little uh, bungalow, a woman by the name of Mara, she has the eye on this man. She said, she heard rumors that he comes from a very wealthy German family, and when the war is over, he's going to go back, and we're going to, you know, I'm going to marry him, and we're going to be millionaires. <laughs> and my mother said, "Go ahead." She said, "He doesn't speak. <laughs> he's very quiet." <laughs> and he was a very serious man all his life, and he didn't sp he didn't talk much. So after my mother passed, is that when we actually started talking to each other, and he was uh, telling me his story. So the New Year's Eve party comes along, and the commander said, well, uh, Schlauer, you go. And he goes, no, I don't go because I don't have any formal clothing. And he said, he said, I don't even have a suit, and I wouldn't go in a suit, you know? It says a tuxedo evening. And he said, Major Roper has a, has a tuxedo. Put it on. He's kind of your size. My father said, my father was five foot uh, seven, 134 pounds his entire life. And he said, this guy Roper was twice my size. He said, not only that, but the tuxedo had tails, you know, and the tails were dragging on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so he just sat at the table during this di dinner dance and didn't move. And my mother, on the other hand, she said, there was one British banker. He comes all the time to dance with me. And, but he kept drinking also. And he started to get a little familiar with me on the dance floor. So she said, I see that he comes again, this guy. So I get up, I go over to her father and said, this dance is yours. And she said, we dance for the next 50 years. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. 10 months later, they married in yeah. August. Mm -hmm. so. And what were their, uh, how did they feel about the British? Oh, tremendous. The tr tremendous <coughs> regard for the Britishers. Yes, they, did, they did take very good care of them. They took a, had a tremendous sense of responsibility for these people. Yeah. And we met some, uh, they, they met some very nice, even though uh, our, uh, my father eventually takes my mother to Tanganyika. She was seven months pregnant at the time and they took a 10 day uh, with, trip with a truck and boat across uh, Lake Tanganyika and then another truck uh, to get to Dar es Salaam. And uh, then he got a job as uh, assistant manager on some plantations that the Brits had in, in Tanganyika. And eventually he worked his way up to becoming a manager of a, a 25,000 sisal plantation in, uh, just outside a town called Tanga, which is kind of the northwest of the capital of Dar es Salaam, closer to the Kenya border. We could actually, from the back of the house, uh, the back uh, veranda, you could see Kilimanjaro. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Now, was there wild animals and stuff around in that area? That oh, yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a um, walking... Uh, there were ten house servants. One of them was an Askari, which is policeman uh, in Swahili. And his job was to walk around the house and keep monkeys and snakes from entering the house. Uh, there were, there, we were on a 1,700 foot elevation and there were palm oil trees around this hill. And so there was another uh, manufacturing business was the processing of these nuts to get the palm oil out. And sisal is a long vegetable fiber and they make rope out of sisal and uh, carpet backing and things like that. 
I think some clothing is even made out of sisal. But mostly it was rope. Uh, the, the purpose of the plantation was produce sisal for rope to be used on, on ships. And uh, we had, uh, oh, there was a scare one day that a lion was somewhere close by, so they built a pit, the natives dug a pit and put meat at the bottom of it. And, uh, and how? He never showed up. <laughs> <laughs> what was the relationship between your family and the natives? And, and the, the whites and the natives ah, you know, in general. Okay. Uh, s uh, some plantations had very good managers and others uh, had not such kind people. Uh, my mother, and this is where I believe that she was taking nursing uh, schooling in the convent school in Czechoslovakia. She did all the first aid on the plantation. If a native uh, cut himself or was bitten by a snake or anything, she had the antidotes and she did the first first aid, and then if it was very serious, uh, then um, she had to clear with the family that he, that the native be taken down to a British mi missionary uh, uh, down at uh, somewhere close by at the bottom of the hill. And then there was a proper hospital there and proper medical care. Um, my, my, both my parents have a belief that there's good and bad in everyone. So you can, and, and these natives are human beings. My father is a little bit bossy with them. He, they were of a different class and a different level in society, and so he had this kind of bossy way about with them. And of course, in those days, they were used to that kind of stuff. But it wasn't, it wasn't unkind. Um, and of course, for my, they had great regard for Memsab. Memsab was, she took care of them. The mama took care of them. <laughs> and I had a yaya as a, as a youngster. First I had a nurse for a while, and then, um, then I had a yaya, and this was a, girl, a native girl, maybe about 13 year, 12, 13 years old, and she just w went around with me and made sure I didn't uh, cause any injury to myself or, or get into any <laughs> very bad mischief. Do you remember but, her name? Batiseba. Yeah. What was that again? Batiseba. <laughs> What's her name? So uh, you were born in forty three. Forty three. Right. And uh, so, how how old were you when you left there? I was about six, maybe going on seven. So you remember some of yeah, the stuff yeah, that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. Did you have some? Uh, uh, were you any friends with any of the native uh, kids? That's all I did was play with the native kids. Uh, um, yeah, we would go into town once a month for supplies. We grew our own vegetables. We had chickens, ducks, uh, uh, and we would go one, one, once a month to town. We had, we could get film, you know, we have photographs of the time. And, and uh, uh, we would spend, the, of course, we would spend a couple of days in town because it took, to go 50 miles in Africa in those days was not the easiest thing was in the world. Was there a movie theater in town? I don't recall that. I don't, I don't think. I know there was a train, because my father wanted to photograph me standing in front of the, the locomotive, and I wouldn't do it. I stood to the side of it. Oh. <laughs> I'd say, it was very scary. We had our own little train on the plantation to get these leaves to the uh, factory to process them. And um, But when you talk about animals, the, the sisal plant is like the agave plant here in the desert. Right or in Mexico, okay. they make the tequila from it. Oh, you know, yeah. it's these mm -hmm. long, broad leaves, and the heart of this plant is very uh, tasty for the monkeys, and they would come and rip out the heart. Well, of course, when they ripped the heart out, the plant died. So we had natives uh, patrolling the fields, and they would uh, shoot the monkey and then bring him back, and they would get paid. And uh, there is a, a story where my father had stomach ulcers uh, from his teenage years on. And uh, at one point, uh, apparently the ulcer perforated, and he had to be taken down to the missionary, and then the missionary said, no, this is too much, and he, he needs to go to Dar es Salaam, the capital, to a big hospital. And my mother was left on the plantation with a nine-month-old child, baby, with 15,000 natives, all by herself. And she slapped the gun on her hip, <laughs> didn't know how to use it, but put the holster on and ran the palm oil factory and the sisal factory. But the thing with the monkeys, she didn't know that they, they did 
when these guys brought the monkey, they chopped the tail off because if you didn't, they kept bringing the same monkey back. <laughs> and first of all, I think they did it for the money. But the other problem was is they were collecting ammunition. You see, they were only permitted one bullet at a time. So when they killed a monkey, they brought him in, they got another bullet, and they got their money. And so she said, all of a sudden, you know, it's on the third day, this monkey was looking pretty ragged, <laughs> you know, that this one guy was bringing back. <laughs> and so she said, what, what is, you know, and, and the assistant, who was a native, said, you know, well, this is, this guy is tricking us. <laughs> He's tricking you. So anyhow, that was solved. And then, of course, now she doesn't know what the condition of her husband is. He's in hospital hundreds of miles away, and, and this, this can't continue that she runs this plantation by herself. My mother was four foot eleven, <laughs> hundred pounds, you know. <laughs> and so she called up the British, the district commissioner, and said, or, or the head of the company, or whoever was in charge, and said, you know, I'm up here in, in Magrota, I'm all by myself, and I have a nine-month-old nine child. I don't know if my husband's dead or alive or what's going on. And she said, I need help. And the guy said, well, the only man I have is a bachelor. How would that look? And she said, I'm here with 15,000 men. How does the native men, how does that look? <laughs> the man came. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were some other stories. That, you know, um, our closest neighbor was 50 miles away. And there were Europeans, uh, one sort or another. And, and uh, some women couldn't take the isolation. And there was a woman, they, they sent a message one day that the woman at the neighboring plantation had shot herself in the head and, and died, and that uh, my parent, my mother should come and prepare the body for burial, right? So she, well, of course, we all went. And there were two little boys left behind, and my <coughs> husband, and, and my mother was preparing the corpse, and at one point she, she sat the corpse up to put a dress on it, and she said, Reynushka Mosten was the littlest hole in the head, you know? And she said she sat her up and turned around to get the dress, and the jaw moved, you know, or ah. And she scared the hell out of me. <laughs> so now, some uh, in the 1980s, my parents had a contract in West Africa, in in um, Conakry, uh, Conakry, uh, Conakry, Guinea, West Africa and 150 miles away from the capital. It took 14 hours to drive that distance. And they had a man on the team, a Scotsman, Scotty, and uh, he had a heart attack in the middle of the night, could not be saved, and passed away. And they said, well, now we have to get the corpse back to the capital, kind of Cree, and then send his body back to, uh, to Scotland, to the family. And my mother said, okay. And she said, she held the man as he died. Hmm. And then uh, sh they said, well, we'll send the French translator. <laughs> To, with the body back to, to Conakry. And uh, my mother, in the last moment, said, wait a minute. And she took her scarf and she put it around. <laughs> she said, because if this guy starts to make the noise, this French guy's going to run out of the car <laughs> in 14 hours, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I leave the story. <laughs> um, so you really didn't have any other white children to play with? No, they were so no, no, no. Away. No, first time I saw a bunch of white kids in one spot was when we arrived in New York and I was sent to first grade. <laughs> now, do you, do you have any brothers and sisters? No. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, tell you what, we're getting pretty, well, I got a few more minutes on here. I'll, I'll be changing tape here in just a little bit. Um, t tell me a little bit more, or any other uh, memories of living there in Africa? And did the, all, and all the time that you were there, was there any uprisings at all with the natives? Uh, okay, uh, well, the uh, uprising, no. Mau Mau problems were to come in the 50s, uh, and that was in Kenya. Uh, there was, uh, the Brits would send around the DBT uh, outfit every once in a while for control of insects, I guess. I, uh, assume. And th there were, these natives did communicate with drums. And there's a, s a story about that. My first charge account was at the native store. There was fi uh, uh, 5,000 uh, laborers on the plantation itself. So figure three to a family, you've got 15,000. And they had their little village there, and they had uh, stores and things. And 
and there was one store that had very bright handkerchiefs and pocket knives, and I was attracted to this. And I, Bati Seven and I would go down there, and of course I'm the white child, I, I can do as I please, and I would pick out handkerchiefs and pocket knives and, you know, walk out. So basically, and then the guy would tell my father how much I took and my father would pay him. <laughs> if I'd only thought of the credit card. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, yeah, so there, uh, and I'm, the guy had drums as well, or there were drums in the, na in, in the uh, village, and, and I was, I liked the drumming, and I would dance to it, and I, I kind of went native, I guess, <laughs> and, and as a birthday give, uh, gift, my father said to the, the drum maker, you know, make a drum for my child, and of course, this is Buana's child, so it's going to be a, one heck of a drum. And the guy delivered it on my birthday. He said the thing could be heard forty miles away. <laughs> you know, it's not the not the plan. You know? But anyhow, there was this communications the, the natives to each other, and there was some some news came that this DDT outfit had caused uh, the women to become uh, infertile mm -hmm. at some place. You know, at least this is the connection that the the natives made. And uh, so our guys got a little excited when the car came up the road with, with the DDT uh, team, and, and my father did have to go out there and wave the gun around. And, you know, <laughs> and, and then, of course, he sat down with the head man and tried to reason with him that this is you know, nonsense that you're making this connection. But if you don't want the DDT, we won't have it this month. You know? We also had mules to do work on the plantation. and. Uh, a vet would come every once in a while to check the mules out, and he would stay a couple of days. And we had uh, we had a little uh, Scotty dog, Mijo was his name. My mother named him, and I don't know what Mijo means, <laughs> dandy or something like that. And and hold that thought. I got to change the tape here right now. How you doing? You want a sip of water? Oh, okay. <coughs> How you doing? Dad? Yeah, I... Oh, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> That's a question. Why anything, Dave? Uh, no, thanks. Okay. Exhausted? Oh, no. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. So you were uh, well. Let's, let's finish up. You're talking about your Scotty dog. Oh yeah, we'll the, get into the, the radio stuff. The Scotch Terrier. Um, I don't know whether we can put this on tape, but anyhow, <laughs> um, he, it was a male dog, and we had him for several years. And one afternoon, he went missing. And so, where's Mijo? And the head house boy for the house. There were ten guys just working around in the house. And uh, I believe the man's name was Gravia. He said, well, he was last seen beyond, uh, uh, in your garden. And this was a terrace garden. It went on forever. And beyond it was elephant grass, very tall and never uh, untouched. And they said, we believe that he walked into this elephant grass. So my mother called down to the, my father's office, you know, and send me some natives and they go arm's length and they walk into the elephant grass to try to find Mijo. Now he had been displaying, uh, you know, that he wasn't feeling well, the little dog. And the natives went into this grass and very quickly found it. He had laid himself on top of an anthill. And so they brought him back and my mother bathed him and disinfected him. His testicles were, were infected. And so she made him as comfortable as possible. And then that evening my father and I went to sleep and she got up and she got the dog, took him into the bathroom and said, Nisha, you're dying. And so she said, I will do, I will make an operation, and if you wake up tomorrow morning, ohala, and if you don't, then <laughs> you'll go to a nice place. And she gave him a couple, of, a couple of shots of scotch, 
<laughs> and proceeded to remove his testicles <laughs> and sew him up very nicely. You know, next morning he woke up <laughs> and started to lick his wound. And so she took a pair of my underpants, cut a hole for his tail and put it on. And the natives thought this was the funniest thing. They said, this is Zungu's dog. Zungu means white man. This is the Zungu's dog. He wears clothes. <laughs> you know? A week, a couple of days later comes the veterinary to check on the mules and he pronounces the mules okay. And then my mother said, could you look at the dog? I operated on him a couple of days ago. And the guy looked and he said, he's going to be fine. And Mrs. Schlauer, the stitching is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Is, the, was the vet a uh, white? Yeah, yeah, it was a Britisher. Pocket British. Oh, yeah, he's a gin drinker, too. He liked to sit in the bathtub and drink his gin. And he stayed with us a couple of days. He enjoyed his, his time with us. And the dog and had, the dog never left my mother's side. And my, most men I tell the story to said, I wouldn't either. God knows what else you'd go after. <laughs> um, the natives, what, what, what did they wear? What kind of clothing? They had uh, shorts and shirts. Okay. Uh, they cut off the sleeves. and. Did they like have uh, painted they, No, they, like that? they did have some uh, where they would cut the skin to make designs on the face. Oh, no. And there is a couple of, in that big black uh, folder there, uh, you see a man, a woman. Hmm. And they, these are m markings of beauty. And, like that, yeah. Yeah, but most, uh, I would say most of uh, the majority didn't do these things. And did they speak English? No, we spoke uh, Swahili with them. And then because I hung around with the little kids, I spoke five other dialects my parents didn't even speak. Yeah. 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 Do you remember <laughs> any of it? Every once in a while a Swahili word, you know, comes into my mind. But I still have the grammar book, though. It's yeah. quite uh, almost crumbling. <laughs> and what about, well, also, um, did you, did you, uh, what religion were, was your family, or, or did you go to church, or or was it, and you said there was a mission. There was a, uh, yeah, it, it would be a Church of England missionary. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, you should mention. So I'm born in the hospital, and my mother is uh, Eastern Catholic, and so she's, she does not want to remove me from the hospital until I'm baptized, because if something happens to me, I am a lost soul, <laughs> right? And Limbo. the closest church was the Church of England, so I'm baptized Church of England. And my mother, uh, <laughs> her Russian church, and my father, he, uh, you know, after World War II, uh, it was the, the Jewish, again, is a, the, the Jewish question is always, uh, it's trouble for business, it's, you know, Although he walked around with a chip on his shoulder, and he let you know that he came from, a, he was descended from a Jew. My uncle Bernard covered up. He would not. He came to the states first, and there was still this gentleman's agreement going on, uh, you know. Or, and he worked. To, he went to Columbia University at night and got his CPA, even though he had a, a degree in economics from the University of Geneva in Switzerland. And. Um, he worked, he went to work for a big uh, accounting company, and although his work was perfect and people liked him, they couldn't remember his last name, and it had a Jewish connotation to it, the name. So Bernard is the one who invented the name Scholten. Mm -hmm. you know, he just put it together by himself, so it could not be, you can't identify as Scandinavian, German, what is it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then he got a job with um, Gulf Oil, and definitely hid his background because it would not have been accepted at Gulf Oil. And he worked his way up and uh, at the age of 60, he was, f at 60 you were forced to retire from Gulf Oil. It's like the airlines, <laughs> at 60 you're out. And he retired from Gulf Oil as the vice president of marketing for the European division. And this uh, is your uncle you're talking about? My uncle Barnett, yeah. Hmm. Okay, and yeah. so how did you get the Shulton name? When we came, to, okay, so Bernard and, and the parents and the uh, mate of the youngest uh, sister, they came to this, they got their, their visa to come to U.S. in 1946. And we arrived in late 49. And uh, <coughs> uh, Bernard, of course, told his brother. 
<laughs> we need to, you need to get rid of that name. <laughs> so, so we did. There was some Judge Davis at the federal uh, courthouse in Brooklyn uh, made the final stamp of yes. <laughs> well, back, <coughs> back to Africa now. Um, did you go to school? Have any school to go to or anything? No, no, too far away. Everything was too far away, and I was—I was, I mean, I was still just six years old. So, and Jack mentioned, did you have a radio or a shortwave or anything like that? There was some sort of telephone communications. I don't know how it was done over these great distances, but I remember going to my father's office on the plantation and and seeing the, this thing. And at one point, I made some sort of scratchy. I was age of four, some boxes and lines and things, and I said. I've invented this machine, and I think the King of England would be interested. So send you should call him and tell him about it. <laughs> yes, after you leave, I will call. <laughs> but I mean, any communication with the outside world, basically? Oh, uh, radio, I shortwave radio. Yes, shortwave. we used to yes. we used to listen to Churchill. My mother and I didn't know what the man was saying, but my father understood him. <laughs> Because the common language between my parents uh, was was French. Okay. So you did not know English. I did not know English when I arrived in America. Uh, no. Uh -huh. And uh, and 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 I almost made a terrible faux pas in Paris, because we went um, from uh, I'm going to say from we flew we took a bus to Nairobi, and then we flew to uh, Tunis. And then we went, uh, connected with another aircraft, and finally ended up in, in Paris. And we stayed in Paris for a few days, and my parents knew, my, my father knew Paris very well. And uh, he dated a Vogue model there when he was a young man. Yes, the, the niece of the painter Claude Monet. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Betty Bogart was her name. It's funny, because it's not, not uh, the one who married Bogart, yeah. Lauren Bacall. And she was a cover model, yeah, for Vogue, mm -hmm. Paris Vogue. And my mother said, I let him to look her up to see if she's still around, because I wasn't worried. <laughs> and, uh, but the faux pas that I almost made in Paris was, we, were in, we went in the hotel, we went to the restaurant to eat. And this is the first time in my life that I saw a white man serving a white man. And I luckily chose that moment to, to use Swahili and not French, why is the Zungu serving the Zungu? Why is the what? I could have said it in French, you know, and really mucked things up. But <laughs> and my mother then told me, she said, from now on, things will be very different. <laughs> so, um, so um, okay, so you're on your way to the United States. Right, now. right. So. What was your... Um, well, uh, one other thing I wanted to ask, um, do you remember, perhaps you don't, but your parents when they heard that the war was over, and any reaction to that? Hmm. Never, it was never discussed, you know? No, we were just living our lives there. Yeah. There was, uh, oh, as I told you before, in 1948, the Refugee Commission uh, of the League of Nations wrote my father and said, that uh, since he was evacuated out of Cyprus, that they are now very happily going to repatriate him to Cyprus. And of course, he was not from Cyprus, he was from Germany. And so, and, and he wasn't interested in going back to Germany either. He had made himself a nice life here in Africa. I mean, he had hit the top that he could get to, and things were going very nicely. And so he wrote back to the, uh, to the commission and, and asked permission to please be left alone and if he can stay in, in Tanganyika, and six months uh, it took for these guys to make their decision and write him back and say, okay, stay in Tanganyika. We have decided you can stay. I think you had mentioned that when you were born, you were really a, a girl without a country, so to speak. Right, right. Um, th because of the Nuremberg laws uh, that the Nazis put in place, where the German Jews lost their citizenship, my, f my father's family, of course, became uh, stateless. Uh, and uh, that's the other thing is they're, they're traveling around and they have no country. <laughs> and uh, my mother, because she married my father in East Africa, uh, lost her Czech passport and took on his status of being stateless. 
And then because I was born in Tanganyika, which was a territory and not a colony of Britain, I did not become a British citizen. The clerk at the hospital asked my parents, oh, what, what is your nationality? And that's what will make your daughter. And my father said, I'm stateless and my wife is stateless. So on my birth certificate, it is written stateless. <laughs> Could they have said anything else? Could they have said, I'm an American or I am so and so? And uh, and not have any proof of it? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, and I, I don't think, <laughs> you know, uh, when you're being pushed around like that, sure. you try to do everything sure. correctly sure. Sure. to sure. stay out of trouble. Yeah. So I don't think it Fair entered point. their minds. Now you were sick. Were you sad to leave uh, Africa when you left? And was your father, because he did have a good job and everything, was it mixed emotions whether he should leave or not? Not at all. He had hit the top. There was nowhere, nowhere else to go. His brother had come to America and said, if you come to this country and you promise to behave yourself and you work hard, he said, you can make something of yourself here. There is that ability. It's a fantastic land of opportunity. And I was telling a story to a, a young woman the other day as I took her to Palm Springs Airport. You know, and she said, well, where were you from originally and so on and so forth. Well, why did you come to America? Why would they want to leave Africa? <laughs> I said, everybody wants to come to America, you know? <laughs> I said, you don't understand what you have, you know? <laughs> uh... I wanted to ask you, uh, were there any remnants of uh, the German, uh, either German people still living in Tanganyika when you went there, or the culture and stuff like that, or had it pretty much become Brit Britain? It was, it was British, through and through. Yeah. Okay, so you, you make it to Paris. Oh, there were some Greeks there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think there was a Greek community. Uh -huh. I don't know, maybe there were some Germans, but I'm sure they were quiet. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so you're in Paris now. Right. On your way, and right. then what? <laughs> then we board a, uh, a um, what was it, a super constellation. TWA? <laughs> TWA, super constellation. And we arrived at Idlewild Airport, and it was Quonset Huts in those days. <laughs> no? And uh, we, uh, we were obliged, in order to get into the United States, not only do we have the visa, but we are then obliged to prove that we have a sponsor in America who will take care of us in case we f my father fails not to be able to support us. Uh, and we also had our little chest x-rays to show that we were healthy and all sorts of medical documentations. To, to show that we were in good health. And we arrived and uh, uh, my father found a job with a, a, a fiber company. Um, he asked me, I don't know what the name of the company was, but uh, they were doing a lot of business in the Caribbean and so he traveled there. Was this in New York City? In New York City, lived? yeah. Do you remember uh, where you first lived or what oh, street? Yes. One one o two thirty five sixty fourth Road, Forest Hills, <laughs> oh, <so. Yeah. laughs> yeah. in an apartment building on the sixth floor, one bedroom. Mm -hmm. The money my parents brought from Africa translated to U.S. dollars, very little, and so my father had the day job of uh, working for this uh, fiber consulting company. He sold Nash cars uh, after work in the evening, and he translated uh, German documents for the U.S. Army, for which he was given a medal and a, and a certificate of merit. I had a 1950 Nash. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He had the, the big jelly bean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had a, I think it was lime green one, Nash Ambassador. Oh, was, oh we polished that car like crazy. <laughs> And the neighborhood that you lived in, was it kind of an ethnic neighborhood or, or yeah. what? Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. A little bit of everything? Uh -huh. A little bit of everything, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Did you make friends pretty easily? Yeah, I went to, I went to first grade, uh, pub public school. What school was that? Uh, P.S. something. I don't know what it was. Uh, and by chance... But you didn't speak English. No, but by sheer luck in the class was a Persian boy, so Iranian, he spoke French, and a French boy. But within, it took me one month to pick up uh, enough English to communicate with my, my little friends. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And then I, I did a horrible thing that I didn't realize at the time, and I only found out maybe 10 years ago after my mother passed away. My father said, you came home from school one day, and you announced that from now on you're speaking only English and nothing else. And he said, your mother almost died because she spoke very little English. And so he pulled a book out. He, he, he always had a lot of books around him. And as a matter of fact, one, one wooden box were two, two bookshelves on either side, and it was in our, our living room in Africa, and it had hinges on it, and he built it, and you closed it, and it became one uh, big rectangular wooden box, and that's how the books came, and some, some other things in this box came to America. Anyhow, he pulled out a, a book, and he, he gave it to my mother in the morning, and he said, read the first page only, and underline the words you don't understand, and tonight I'll come home and I'll, I'll help you. He said he came home, and almost every lousy word on the page had been uh, underlined, you know. But uh, and I don't know how she did it, but she learned to speak English, and she had tremendous command of the English language. Yeah, but she ma she kept her the the Russian accent, the Ukrainian <laughs> accent. Sure. And I said, Mumsy, you've been here long enough. You could, you know, your your accent shouldn't be so strong. She said, Don't be stupid. They find it charming. I keep it up. <laughs> Oh, and I can get away with things too when I make a mistake in English. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> she was Mashat. She was a naughty one, that one. Uh, may I tell the, the story when she first starts in the show business and gets paid? Okay. Um, she, the, her first paycheck, she went and uh, had the seamstress, uh, it had to be in Cyprus, uh, make a, uh, a cape a black velvet on the outside, white satin on the inside. And she picked it up when it was prepared and she went to the nightclub in, in the afternoon when they were rehearsing and she walked in and she twirled around in this cape and they dubbed her Hamlet. <laughs> Here she comes with her cape. <laughs> now, after the war breaks out and wherever they are, it's uh, they're under British, uh, and again, you know, they're they are checked out every once in a while. Their papers are checked and they're checked out that they're not spying and so on and so forth. And uh, she decided she's not going to go to rehearsals in the afternoon and she went around and played around somewhere doing some, who knows what. And she comes back in the afternoon and she walks into the club and the other entertainers, they said, oh, he's so angry that you weren't here. He's so upset, you know? And she's, okay, never mind. And she goes out on the stage and there's George at the table and he said, aha, uh -huh, there she is. Big shot, because she is the sister-in-law of the head of this troupe. She thinks she can take a day off whenever she wants. And my mother looked at him and she said, Ed, I, Georgie, you know what happened to me. She said, the British police, they picked me up. Something about my papers, no good. And they took me to the police station up to the second floor. They didn't give me a chair to sit down. They questioned me and questioned me for hours. And then this one policeman, he comes to me, and I know he's going to do something very bad. So I ran to the window, and I jumped out, and he grabs my leg, and he pulls on it, and pulls on it like I'm pulling on yours. <laughs> That's Arza. <laughs> that is. That, <laughs> that is so nice. typical. And, the, and her other favorite thing was, if she didn't get her way, I kill myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this went on <laughs> forever. <laughs> did she um, did she work at all in the states? Ah, uh, there's a story there too. Uh, she wanted to. Uh, I got to maybe the sixth grade, seventh grade, and she thought, you know, the kids. She's big enough now that she can take care of herself. And so she said to my father, "I'm going to work now." And I said, "No wife of mine will ever work." Okay, but she got dressed up the next day anyhow. Went into Manhattan and went to an unemployment agency, and uh, or an employment agency, and said, you know, I want to get work. And they said, can you type? No. Can you do uh, stenography? No. Uh, and some other question, no. And they said, well, what can you do? She said, I speak many languages. <laughs> so they said, well, okay, fill out the card, and then go sit outside, and we'll see if we can find something for you. And she went out, and she sat in this reception area, and there is a, a girl sitting next to her, a young girl, very thin, pale, you know, and doesn't look well at all. 
And she said, my dear, she said, when did you eat last? And the girl said, two days ago. And she said, I had, and I'm not finding work. And my mother said, okay, just a minute. And she goes there and she said, tear up the card. I don't want to take the work away from somebody who really needs it. And she comes back and she took the girl to lunch and gave her $20 and went home. Hmm. Then one day she is with some friends walking down Fifth Avenue window shopping. And uh, they're talking away and all of a sudden this man who was behind them, she said, very distinguished looking guy, beautiful clothes. And he said, excuse me, he said, I'm listening to your accent and I am the producer of a radio uh, soap opera and I could, we need somebody with an accent on the radio station. And here's my business card, you know. And so my mother went home all excited. She said, Erwin, I can get the job on the radio because I speak with an accent. <laughs> and he said, no wife of mine will ever work. <laughs> and end of story. Mm. Now my dad had to travel because of uh, his business, always to tropical and subtropical countries. And then in the beginning when we first came to New York, it was two, three weeks at a time, and then he'd be home. And then uh, I remember in junior high school, high school, he was gone months, you know, a couple of months here, because he was going to the Far East and Middle East and back to Africa. And then when I, uh, and he always said, Marit, uh, come with me, you know, you have to travel with me. And she said, no, as long as the kid is at home, I take care of her. And so anyhow, I went to college finally. And uh, so when I left for college, then she said, okay, I'm going to travel with your father now. We are going to work together. And she said, I am the note typing secretary, public <laughs> relations. <laughs> and she had a sixth sense for people, you know, good, bad, trust or not trust. And my father never closed a business deal until my mother had dinner with the people. And then she gave thumbs up or thumbs down. Like most women. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I don't. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a real stinker. I'm picking people. <laughs> Where did you go to high school? Um, all right, I went public school through junior high, and then the choice at that time uh, we had moved to Jackson Heights, and from that junior high school you could be sent either to Bryant High School or Newtown High School, and this is 1959 or 58, somewhere around there, and. In those days, the, the leather jackets and the chain gangs, you know, it's the, the, ga the gangsters. <laughs> today is so mild. West, West, it's so, story. yeah, so mild compared to what goes on today. And my father said, no, you're not going to go to either one of those. And of course, I raised a ruckus. And he said, you have a choice. You go to private school in Jamaica Estates in New York, or you can go to Switzerland to finishing school. <laughs> so, well, at least I'll be home in the afternoon to hang out with my pals. <laughs> so I selected prep school in, in Jamaica States. <laughs> Henley High. Invictus was our uh, motto. Oh. Unconquered. <laughs> yeah, well that movie just came yeah, out. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. I know. Did, when did my roommate that? said to me, she said, what does Invictus mean? I said, it means unconquered. She said, how do you know this stuff? I said, it's a fantastic brain. <laughs> I said, no, my high school, that was the, the yearbook. <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, um, did you have any uh, side jobs or anything like that when you were growing, when you were? I worked in the summertime. I, uh, well, I went up to summer camp for two uh, almost two months in New Hampshire. And so I, first I went as a camper, and then I went as a uh, assistant counselor in a bunk, and then I went as a full-fledged counselor, and I had some talent with archery, so I was the field uh, archery teacher. And then... Oh, I, just, I stayed one summer. I stayed in the city, and I worked in a cleaners, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then off to college, I went. What what uh, what what um, what classes did you like in high school? Had history, oh, okay. history, without a doubt. And that is because of a teacher, Mr. McCormick. Uh, the prep school was very small, so I think the biggest class we had was biology class, and that was maybe eight people in that one. Uh, otherwise, the class is, you know, four, six, one, one class was two. Uh, but this guy, McCormick, he was a big Irishman, big shock of white hair on his head, and he would act out the American history. He would be Andrew Jackson one day and something else, you know, and he'd play all these parts, mm -hmm. and he just hooked me into the, into the history. And so, mm -hmm. and then the, in my freshman year, because I only went to college two years, 
But my freshman year, I also ran into the history teacher, Mr. Bass, at Roanoke College, another fantastic teacher. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Was that in Virginia? Yes, no, yes, Salem, Virginia. Okay. Yes. The girls from Lynchburg got the seats on the train before we got on to come to Washington, D.C. <laughs> to connect to go to New York, so we were obliged to sit on our suitcases. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any special boyfriends in high school or college? Um, I had, uh, there was one, f uh, one fellow, and I ended up marrying the guy for about 10 weeks between my, my freshman year and, and, and sophomore year in college, uh, Peter. And he was um, part Chinese, part Danish. His, mm -hmm. uh, his father had been a, Dan uh, a Danish pilot in China. Yeah. yeah. Oh. yeah. And so what was his name? Peter, Peter Geraldine. Yeah. And, and do you know his father's name? No. Well, Geraldine had to be the father's Jardine. name. How, how do you spell that? J-A-R-L-D-A-N-E. -J so he was a Danish pilot in China? Yeah. During World yeah, War II? I guess, yes. Had to be, since we're the same yeah, age. Yeah, probably so. Well, that'd be, uh, yeah. Bob, Bob's good at uh, looking up historical things and we can find him somewhere. Like I said, we were only married for about no, no, ten no, weeks. Yeah, that, <laughs> and my no. father said, I did, "This is nonsense." <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going I'm, to do I'm this. About his, his father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so, what did you do after um, you finished co college? Then? And I, I came back to New York, and as I said, my parents were traveling, so I lived in their apartment, and uh, I got a, I opened up the New York Times and dragged myself all over Manhattan and found the job with Blue Shield. At that time, Blue Shield were, was for the doctors, Blue Cross for the hospitals. And I was a telephone interviewer. And I would get calls on how little we paid for whatever terrible procedure these people had. <laughs> and you don't, I've been paying you guys for a hundred years so much and that equals so much, and you only pay 250 for the operation. And I said, it's an insurance, it's not a savings account, <laughs> you know. And then if you couldn't convince them that we hadn't ripped them off, then it was, uh, this uh, case was then pro sent up to another level of person who <laughs> talked talk to this person and tried to convince them that they hadn't been cheated. <laughs> and Did then, you did you Sorry. go to a lot of plays and stuff like that? I mean, did you, did you enjoy living in New York? Yeah, later on, as I, I got a little bit older, more, more mature. I was a, I was a, my Uncle George always said, you were a very young whatever age you were. You know, I, was, I don't know what I was piddling around. And the, as a child, I learned to, my parents took me to Flushing Meadow Park. And the only thing was uh, that uh, hemisphere, uh, hemisphere, that globe that was left over from the 1939 World's Fair. And there was an ice skating ring there in, this, in the winter time, so I would go ice skating there. And my father taught me to, uh, to ride a bicycle uh, at the age of seven. Well, Flushing Meadow Park is right on the other side of uh, Flushing Bay from LaGuardia Airport. And the planes used to go overhead. And my eyes were constantly up there watching these airplanes. And when I was old enough and could uh, had a big bicycle and could uh, drive, you know, <coughs> go wherever I wanted to, I always drove to LaGuardia Airport to watch the airplanes. So my heart was always up there in the sky. And uh, after Blue Cross, uh, after Blue Shield, I went to reservations in American Airlines, worked there for a while, then Mohawk Airlines reservations, and then I said, I'm going to fly. Know? And I was all of uh, five foot three and a half and maybe 95 pounds. And I walked into United Airlines and they looked at me and they said, How much do you weigh? And I knew that there was a minimum weight. I said, I'm 110 pounds and I'm five foot six. <laughs> and they said, Well, when you get to 100 pounds, you come back and talk to us. <laughs> you're too little. And I got, and American Airlines said, You're too European in your speech and, and mannerisms. Uh, this is 1965. So you wanted to be yeah. a stewardess. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I mean, pilot. First, I, I told my parents I wanted to go to the Air Force because I somehow I was going to end up in an airplane in the Air Force, a fly pilot. And uh, my father said, "Nice girls don't go to the military." 
you know, you got this old Victorian upbringing, <laughs> you know? and so they're out of the country long enough now, you know, so I'm going to do it. And so it went to American, to, to European, uh, went to TWA, and I don't know what their problem was, but I, she said, the, at the interview, they said, uh, on Friday, if you are accepted on Friday, you will receive a telegram that you've been accepted. On Monday, you'll receive an airplane ticket to go to Kansas City for training. And it was just the 4th of July weekend, and I said, and I didn't, I didn't think the interview was going well, and I said, I was planning on going up to New Hampshire to visit some friends. I said, should I wait for the telegram? She said, no. <laughs> you know? And then I went to Pan American, and they said, you're perfect, multilingual, you know, so on and so forth. Too little. <laughs> so I walked out of Pan and I said, well, that's, I'm never going to fly. And I was all upset with myself, and, and some friend of mine said, there's a helicopter airline in New York, and they want little women on board, okay? Where are they? They're at the Marine Air Terminal near LaGuardia. <laughs> so I drove down there and, and walked in, and the chief stewardess was a woman named Astrid Anderson. She was five foot seven. And I said, uh-oh, <laughs> it's not looking good. And so talked to me for a while, and she said, okay, uh, you're going to now interview with a gentleman, uh, VP of Operations. So I interviewed with him, and they said, you're accepted. Ah, uh, Seventh Heaven. I flew for New York Airways for 15 years. Is that right? We were a commercial scheduled airliner. Consequently, uh, they were obliged to have a flight attendant on board the aircraft. And the uh, president at that time decided he was going to have lady stewardesses, where LA Airways, San Francisco Airways, and Chicago Airways doubled their cargo agents as a as a flight attendant. So there you are. I finally did make it into the aircraft. What kind of helicopters did were they flying then? We had uh, my, the first one I flew was uh, December eleventh, nineteen sixty five, and it was off the top of the Pan Am building. That was specifically why they were hiring uh, additional flight uh, stewardesses. I have to after the EOC we were called flight attendants. Uh -huh. I never cared for that. I was like stewardess. Yeah. But, um, Stews. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we had a mulligan stew, Eileen Mulligan. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so uh, it was a Boeing Vertol 107, which is the Chinook in the military. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we went to Twin Otters for a while because we lost our government subsidy, and the airlines also, Pan Am said, yeah, or TWA said, you're costing us too much money to run your operation. So we shut the, we got rid of the helicopters and flew, flew uh, twin ot bu uh, the Havilland Twin Otters. <laughs> cabin height, 4 foot 11 inches. Cabin width, 6 feet. We are squeezing 18 humans in there plus the stewardess. <laughs> and so little was better in that yeah, case. Yeah, and we only flew five days a week. We did not fly on the weekends, and we only flew between the airports. Whereas with the helicopter, we were in Wall Street. And we were, and at that time was only a pier, and and part of the corner of the pier was kind of like ee, ee, dinky dinky, you know. And um, did you have any close calls in helicopter, any helicopter missions? Me, myself, uh, no. I had a dual engine failure, but we auto rotated. It happened right over Aqueduct Racetrack, the second one. We had the first engine went went out over Prospect Park in Brooklyn, and we were two jet engines on the Boeing. They were CT 58s General Electric. 1,350 shaft horsepower each. <laughs> so one fails, you can go on the other one. And I was, we only had like uh, 11 people on board. So after I did my sightseeing announcement, and it was a direct Newark Kennedy, uh, I went and stood in the back of the cabin behind the passengers, kind of sitting on an armrest, relaxing for the next few minutes. And all of a sudden, off it goes, goes offline. And so I started to walk quietly. They always said, walk quietly no matter what. Walk quietly because they get excited. When you run, they think something's wrong, right? You're on fire, walk quietly. <laughs> and so I walked quietly up. And we had, we had the uh, cockpit door open all the time. And we were taught to read uh, the instruments. We, we gave altitude and airspeed. And plus, w after a while, you learn what these other little needles are doing. And sure enough, one whole set of needles was lying sideways. And uh, and as I was observing that, all of a sudden, the other needles went went to went to sleep, and there's Aqueduct Racetrack, and um, 
I had not flown with his captain that much. He had just come back from six months leave. He had suffered from vertigo, you know. So I'm going, okie dokie, <laughs> you know. So I turned around and I see that, you know, we're going to ro auto rotate. And we have done this during uh, maintenance checks after an aircraft has, has been maintained. The pilots will test fly it, and sometimes they'll test fly it with us, especially in the morning. They would test fly it with the stewardess so they don't have to go back to the hangar and get you, and then we'd go to the airport and start our day. <laughs> when the union found out about that, they got a little excited, and we said, no, this is the best time. It's the best part of the, the work day, you know, is doing all these flippy floppies up there. <laughs> so, and, and I just turned around, and they, according to the manual, the captain tells the co-pilot, the co-pilot tells the stewardess. Not in real life. <laughs> the both of them are busy. And their their radio, their little radio buttons are just, you know, like little crickets up there. So I just turned around and made a normal announcement that we're approaching Kennedy and to please make sure their seatbelts are securely fastened. Put their cigarettes out. <laughs> and I did the seatbelt check and came and sat down. And I sat in the seat that I could see in the cockpit. And we landed right on the numbers one three left. <laughs> right at the end of the runway, one three left. And uh, I stood up, and of course I'm waiting that they're going to talk to me. And it's quiet because the engines aren't running. Right? The blades are slowing down. And they're not talking to me, but I see out of the cockpit window that the fire trucks are coming. So I'm going, you know, they shouldn't get excited, my little passengers. So I spun around and said, you know, we've had some sort of mechanical difficulty, but everything's under control and there's no problem and the fire trucks will be surrounding us just as a precaution. You know, nothing to get excited about. Please remain seated. Nobody's telling me to get them off. <laughs> and I'm waiting. And the, and the Port Authority fireman opens up the doors, get them out. <laughs> I said, he didn't tell me to get them out. Leave me alone. <laughs> and then our uh, little school bus painted New York Airways came up because we used to pick up passengers from the other terminals and then take them from our aircraft to the other terminals at Kennedy. They pulled up and then so off off we went. And that was that was about as exciting as it got. And it was it was contaminated fuel. Oh. Mm -hmm. When they opened up the tanks it came out looked like milk. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. We uh, and for some reason we had we had refueled at, Ken at Newark and we never did that. We always refueled at Kennedy. Well, Newark had some bad stuff. So there we are. 25 passenger aircraft, the Boeing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Twin Otter was the 18 passengers, and that didn't last very long. <laughs> and then we had the then we went into the Sikorsky's, the S61L model, with the fixed landing gear, not amphibious at all. The Boeing could land in the East River, and it did. It was before I got hired, when they transitioned from the Boeing 44, which is that it's shaped like that, you know, the tail really ugly beastly looking thing with things sticking out of it and oh god awful airplane uh, when they transitioned to the Boeing Vertol the seagulls that used to sit on the pier at Wall Street didn't recognize this the sound of the jet engines versus the piston engines in the 44s and so when we came in over the Brooklyn Bridge or came over from Newark past Governor's Island these seagulls knew the sound and they would leave the pier. <laughs> you know? Well, they didn't recognize this new sound, so they just stayed there. You know, and kind of. And as George King let down, well, the rotor wash kicked up a few of these birds, and a couple of them went into the engine. But on takeoff, it happened, and he he landed in the East River and taxied up to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and then passengers were oh. taken off the aircraft and. It was George King and Carol Acock was the stewardess, and I don't know who the co-pilot was, but they they had the three ditchings in the East Room. We said, he's doing it on purpose to get in the paper. <laughs> and George King was a, a B-17 pilot in England. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. That was quite a career. And so what did your parents think about that career for you? They were overseas when I took the job. And the thing is, my parents were more concerned that I was quitting work and going to other, you know, going somewhere else. And my father sat me down and he said, you know, I have a little concern. You're a quitter. You quit school. Now you quit this job. You got another one. Then you quit that one. You get another one. You know, and I said, no, but in America you can do this. 
<laughs> it's it's not considered a bad thing. And he said, no, you're going to have a re you're going to have show your record's going to show that you're a quitter. <laughs> and uh, so anyhow, so they were returning from a trip, and I went out and met them in my uniform. It was a winter uniform, and then they went off to South America, and they came back. It was summertime. Now I switched to summer uniform at New York Airways, and you know, new shoes. It's the the new employee. You. You go grocery shopping in your uniform the first couple of months. You're so, and me, I was so excited. I was flying. And uh, so I showed up in my summer uniform to pick him up at the International Arrival Building. And my mother said, again, she quit another uniform. <laughs> 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 no, 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 I'm still with the same company. No. <laughs> <Clever. laughs> but uh, the, this Pan Am building thing uh, was a Category A operation uh, for the FAA. Uh, which is very strict on maximum gross weight. You could fudge a little on the other routes, you know, uh, carry a little more baggage, <laughs> and they would not put it all on the manifest. The FAA doesn't know this, right? They're not going to see this. <laughs> Anyhow, the company's out of business. So. Uh, yeah, so, of course, my parents come, and, and here I am. I'm I'm finally made it to being a stewardess. <laughs> I'm all tickled pink with myself, and they didn't. They they didn't object to you know. They kind of put up with with my <laughs> stuff that I w would do. Not didn't pay bills. The electricity wasn't on one time when they came home. And, but you know, we will go to jail if we don't pay our bills, Raina. Right yeah, well. <laughs> so were you living by but yourself then? When you yeah, were? in their apartment. Yeah. Oh, in their apartment. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, <laughs> anyhow. So now it's time for them to leave. They're going to Laos on this particular trip. And uh, my father said, well, I want to fly with her as, as the stewardess. So they went from Jackson Heights. They took a taxi into Manhattan, luggage and everything, right? And they weighed my mother's handbag on that Pan Am roof thing. And uh, they got on board the aircraft, and there's all this noise. My mother was not a happy traveler. She didn't fly easily you know she kind of uh, she did it because she had to and this was not I mean I don't know what what consciously she heard or saw when she was on that aircraft with me and of course you're making the announcements and there's all this in the PA systems half the time are so bad and we took off and seven minutes later we landed at Kennedy <laughs> <laughs> and my mother said, was wonderful. Yeah, because she made it on the ground. <laughs> but uh, New York Airways did have an accident on top of the Pan Am building. It was a Sikorsky, and what it was was the landing gear was fracturing from the, it was the, uh, the truck attached to a hollow uh, pipe, which then went into another uh, pipe, and then there was some hydraulic fluids there. And the thing would kind of, when you took off, the, the truck part the, with the wheels would come down a little. And then the Sikorsky landed, and it was a characteristic of the S-61, tail left right. You could not make a three-point landing on that aircraft. They would do it on the Boeings, and that was one of their, uh, the pilot's great pride was to do the three-point. Virtually impossible on the Sikorsky. Not only that, but when you, f when you were coming in for a landing and you flared, it shuddered at 15 knots. <laughs> and you, that was the other thing to try to stop the shutter and to make a three point landing. And the vice president of operations said if he comes in fast and, and flares, he gets rid of the shutter. Yeah, and he also touched the tail rotor at LaGuardia and, and smashed it to pieces. <laughs> Nobody was hurt, but the aircraft stayed yeah. where it stopped, where it landed, it stopped. <laughs> and this Eileen Mulligan was the stewardess on that one. By then I was chief stewardess and I was sitting, uh, my office was next to the dispatch office and then, you know, you kind of in the background hear the radio calls and this little high-pitched voice came across. <laughs> and so we just made a bad one at LaGuardia. <laughs> and they, they got the passengers off and the, and the cockpit crew left and they forgot she was cleaning up the cabin, straightening out the seat belts, and they all left. And so she comes out, walks out of the aircraft on the air stair door, and there's nobody around. So she sat down and started to redo her makeup because she said, maybe the press is coming, you know? <laughs> and they'll take pictures of me and interview me. And the 720, she was one of 13 children, uh, Mulligan. Mm -hmm. And the 727 taxied by, and her brother was the co-pilot on that aircraft. And he's yelling, 
Mama, Eileen, <laughs> what are you doing down there? <laughs> and of course, when the crew called in to the VP of operate uh, to the chief pilot, who was in the next office, I said, where's Eileen? And the, the guy said, where's Eileen? Raina wants to talk to her. And they went, oh, <laughs> oh Christ, she's back at the aircraft. <laughs> Baby <laughs> Redoing yeah, her <station>. makeup. <laughs> That's funny. And there you are. That's what they thought of us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, but on top of the Pan Am building, this thing, uh, these aircraft, at, uh, we didn't fly overnight. 11 o'clock at night, all the aircraft were back in the hangar. And then at 5, 5, 5.30 in the morning, things started uh, moving. And... Uh, what they did uh, overnight, the maintenance crew was on, of course, all night long. And they had sonar and they had x-ray. And they, they sonared the, the blades and any other uh, critical parts of the aircraft or x-rayed it. But this tube was fracturing from the inside out, so nothing was picked up. That this was metal fatigue and, and, and was failing. And you could see the last 13 landings on it. And it was 13. Mm -hmm. And when the pilots, of course, you, you fly into the Pan Am building, you're flying, always choosing to go as the wind comes towards you, even though it's a helicopter. But most of, most of the time we came in over the UN building and then flared and then landed on top of the roof and then circled around and there was uh, glued to the rooftop was a red carpet. And the pr another point of pride with the captains who sat on the right seat, by the way, mm -hmm. in ours. Uh, and that was the side that the air stair door was on, was when the air stair door opened that it was lined up directly with the red carpet. <laughs> but the, yeah, so uh, it was Captain Lee Richmond. He landed and he taxied around, lined up beautifully. They offloaded 25 passengers. And then we loaded four people at a time onto the helicopter on the roof because the first time we boarded passengers and let them all out of the ready room at the same time, they of course got, you know, they were standing and waiting to climb on, on the aircraft. And a few of them stepped aside and went over to the edge of the roof and took pictures of Manhattan in the rotor wash and all this <laughs> other stuff. So we, we didn't want them doing that. So they this decided four at a time and get them on four at a time. And Lanny Chevalier was the stewardess at the time and she had boarded, uh, I want to say, four or, four or five people or something. And with this, the gear uh, collapsed. The aircraft tilted to the right. The blade hits the roof. One blade disconnects from the rotor head, goes over the side of the edge of the Pan Am building, goes into an office uh, where the guy had just stood up to go changed to some baseball uniform that he's going to go play baseball. And that part of the blade broke off and pieces of it, uh, one piece embedded into 42nd Street into the tarmac through the trunk of a Cadillac car, mm. went through the trunk and embedded itself a couple of feet into the tarmac. Some other pieces went up, uh, up Park Avenue and over to Madison Avenue and landed one into a woman's leg and another piece into a woman's head. And of course she was killed instantaneously. And on top of the building, when the blade, of course the passengers are coming, and this thing went right into them, and the first two could not be identified as man, woman, or what. And the co-pilot, I don't know his name because he was very junior, uh, he was a medevac pilot in Vietnam. He was one of the last four New York Airways hired. And he said he, what he saw on that rooftop, he never even saw in Vietnam. It was just awful. And little, the, the people on the aircraft themselves were safe. And of course, Lanny said she felt that the aircraft was being pulled. And she said, we might be teetering on the edge because she is now standing on what should be the wall. And she's looking up there through a window that should have been over, he, over there, you know? And, um, and the, and the door to the cockpit was on a sliding uh, thing, and it, it just slid closed when the thing went over to its side, even though it had so much dirt in it, we'd, we couldn't close it ourselves. And uh, the first thing she saw was a cargo agent. He had climbed up and, and uh, was opening up the emergency exit window and the back door of the aircraft, and then the co-pilot walked across 
and uh, stuck his head in and he said, everyone okay here? And she said, yes, everything's fine. And he said, well, bringing a baggage bin over and then we can get the people to climb out through the back door. And that's how they got off. And Lanny came around and, well, we had little first aid kits. They were about this big. One in the cockpit, one in the cabin. The cabin one was a little bit bigger. The cockpit one, about so big in the cabin. She said, it was gone in seconds. You know, and there was a doctor down in the copter club. There's a restaurant bar downstairs. And so he came up and it was a mess. And then uh, we voluntarily cancel, uh, canceled the rest of our flying until they could investigate what had happened. And that was on a, a Tuesday, I think, the accident. And on uh, by Saturday, we were, the FAA said we could go again. Hmm. So okay. the people on the roof, two were killed and were others injured? They were injured, yeah, a lot of injured. I mean, one guy, phew, he got the blade through the side here. Hmm. But he lived. Hmm. And we were on the front page of the Daily News, New York Times, and whatever other paper was in New York for four days. My parents were in Bangkok at the time. And the moment anything, any accident happened in New York, I was wired, not not on the not on the aircraft. I'm okay, you know. Mm -hmm. But they said we even got the news in Bangkok. You know, this is uh, it's a big deal. 1977. You don't you don't have CNN and all this other no. stuff, you know. No, they're not. Are they flying now at all? No, the they airport? they went out a bit. A second accident occurred. <coughs> same captain, same stewardess, same flight <coughs> number would have been the same time of day, except we were on standard time, the first accident, and daylight savings, the second, and it was at Newark Airport, and that one finished us. No, we couldn't, couldn't tolerate it. the publicity, nor the, the expense of... All over the country, and all the other cities as well. Uh, well, uh, LA Airways had gone out of business already long oh. ago. They had all the, these rotor heads failure on this. I mean, when they told us we're getting Sikorsky's, we went, uh, ooh. But Sikorsky promised us, well, we have titanium rotor heads now, you know, this won't happen. And, uh, my maiden voyage on this thing was, uh, <laughs> two guys came on board and they said, so this is the maiden voyage, huh? And I said, yeah, welcome aboard. Everything's brand new, you know, it's all so clean and lovely. <laughs> and we left Kennedy and we got to LaGuardia, it was fine. We went to La from LaGuardia, we went, and they kept looking at me going, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> but, see, it's, it works. And we got to Wall Street and turned around and offloaded some, uh, some passengers and unloaded some passengers. And uh, we go to turn away and <laughs> brake locked <laughs> that side. <laughs> and so it was Ed Monahan was a co-pilot and he had no neck, <laughs> like this. Nice guy. And so he got his little Phillips head screwdriver out and climbed outside and opened up the little nut and bled off some fluid and then closed it up and came around to the front and went like this and the captain tries to move it. It's not moving. Goes and bleeds a little more fluid, and these two guys are going, "Yeah, right. This is brand. Yeah, they've got all the kinks out of this aircraft, right?" <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> you know? And about the third time, when he bled enough fluid off, the, the, the wheel started to the brake release. Then we we went on to Newark, but I said, "This is not good." <laughs> but we we flew for a couple of years with those things. But they, you know, the Boeing Vertol flew like, uh, like a little sports car. It was wonderful. And the, uh, the Sikorsky 61 flew like a truck. It had a very uh, uh, tall profile on, on the side of it. So, and we had prevailing westerly winds. So, and they come through the buildings of Manhattan, and you're going down the East River, and they churn as they come through the buildings, right? So you're, you're doing this going down the East River because it's hitting this wide profile and, oh, I mean, nothing on the Boeings. <laughs> and here you're constantly hanging on to one thing or another, and, you know, to keep from flopping around in the cabin. But you loved it. Yes, I did. We were 250 employees. We had seven helicopters. At one point we had nine when, uh, when Pan Am uh, owned 49% of our stock. They got two, two uh, Boeings and, and painted them in, in Pan Am livery with the blue ball on the tail, <laughs> and underneath were blue stripes. And we would fly by the Goodyear blimp, they go, I have the great white whale in view. <laughs> not, the, not the prettiest paint job. <laughs> and, uh, but um, 
Uh, yeah, so 250 employees, seven, seven aircraft, uh, 30 pilots, maybe 16 to 25 stewardesses, depending on season. And uh, our shortest leg was seven minutes. Our longest leg was uh, 28 minutes. And we carried an average of 1,100 passengers a day. And our motto was never have so few pissed off so many in such little time. <laughs> Specifically in the summertime, because the jet engine is not as efficient in hot air as it is in cold air. So we couldn't lift <laughs> everything, you know? So let's see, the passenger has the ticket, the luggage has nothing. <laughs> okay? We load the people and forget the luggage. So you got this mountain of suitcases at Kennedy and at Newark and at LaGuardia, right? And the steward and we would we would pull the tickets on board the aircraft, right? Miss, it's my bag over there. And of course at Kennedy we taxi past each other. I said, Well you see that helicopter? He takes the bags. <laughs> Just anything to get out of being yelled at. You know? And sometimes between Kennedy and LaGuardia they just truck the bags over. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where, where our motto came from. <laughs> and boy, if you ran, you know, three minutes behind schedule. I mean, we carried mostly businessmen. And they were on these really tight schedules. You know, what the hell are you people doing? There's a three minutes behind. <laughs> we'll make it up in the air. <laughs> Those were the days. Yeah. But the Pan Am roof, VIPs. I mean... I am meeting uh, some business tycoons at Bighorn and at Thunderbird. And uh, what did you used to do, right? Oh, I used to fly in New York, for New York Airways in New York. You know, off the Pan Am building. Oh, yeah, I've been on your helicopter. I said, was the stewardess nice? I think so. I said, well, that was me. <laughs> no, we weren't always nice. I mean, you had your days, right? Oh, I had one with uh, Prince Rainier, and I didn't realize it was him. Off the Pan Am building. They're supposed to tell you when the VIP comes on board. Because sometimes, you, you know, you're back and forth all day long and uh, you know you know your brain dits and the first one to get on is this little roly-poly fairly nice looking man right and he sits in the Boeing on the first double seat which is a, a, adjacent to the emergency exit door with a big placard do not put luggage in this area and there's a little area there it's a little more foot room than the other seats and everybody puts his stinking luggage there in spite of the placard. And so we have this built into us. Oh, God. <laughs> right? So he gets on, and then the three others get on, and now I have a little gap before the next four come. And I am not, Raina was not having a good day that day altogether. And so I bent down, and I said, Sir, the baggage underneath the seat, please. Good. Uh, and we always had our hands up at the door because the door was short, and so you tap their heads so they'd, they would duck and not hit the this metal door and uh, so we had, had uh, good evening good evening good evening guy hasn't moved the muscle so these four get on and bag under the seat no please no thank you <laughs> and good evening good evening good evening and I look at him and he's looking at me like who the hell are you and I'm looking at him like who the hell are you and now I've had enough I've asked you twice right nobody's behind him so I grab his Louis Vuitton luggage <laughs> and throw it on the floor behind his seat and then kick it. Well, there's a little pouch under the seat that holds the life vest. So when you shove a bag under, it's... <coughs> I have the distinction of goosing Prince Renier <laughs> with a suitcase, with his Louis Vuitton luggage. <laughs> I still don't know who this guy is, right? And he gives me... Now he's really looking at me like... Mm, 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 mm. Right? So we bore... Now, 25 people, off we go. We're going to do the sightseeing announcement. We go over to Kennedy, and we land, and we, we landed on a taxiway. And we're taxiing into the Pan Am terminal, and there's a big old limousine and police cars and lights. <laughs> and I'm going, well, Pan Am must have a VIP. <laughs> you know, I'm bored one of their aircraft. And at Kennedy, we refuel, so we shut down when, when he pulls up to his spot. They start turning engines off, and you know the blades start slowing down, and they're applying the brake and all this, and then the door opens, <laughs> and there's Marv, the cargo agent. Where's the prince? And I'm looking at the car, and I recognize Grace Kelly like that, 
And I went, oh dear, <laughs> oh dear, your highness, if you go to the car, I shall be happy to bring your luggage to you. And I said, I'm dead. <laughs> My flying career is over. <laughs> he couldn't care less. I was a little nobody. <laughs> Where's the prince? <laughs> Okay, let's take another break. I gotta change, change tapes. <laughs> Get you a sip of water. I think I'm gonna make a trip out first. Okay. You doing quiet. doing okay, man? Oh yes. <laughs> you want any water, David? Uh, no, I'm fine, thanks. didn't know I was going to go into my New York Airway days. <laughs> oh, I'm glad that, that is so, it's so uh, uh, enjoyable to hear and informative. You don't know anything about that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we had, um, because we connected all the airlines, you know, with each other and we were not competitive, we were not competing with the major air carriers for passengers. Uh, the pass benefits at New York Airways were fantastic. I mean, I flew to Bangkok on a TWA area fare, $149, New York to Bangkok. The only thing is you could get bumped. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, but so how many years were you, uh, uh, did you fly? Almost 15, I would, I would say. So December 11, 65 till May the 1st, 1979, I got my letter of termination uh. due to the recent episode at Newark Airport we're going to close the airline down. Mm -hmm. So was, were you sad, disappointed about it? I had already been, I'd, I'd been uh, away from New York Airways for about two years. Uh, I mean, I was still on the roster, I was still getting my W-2 from, from New York Airways, but I was working for the Association of Flight Attendants, which is a flight attendant union. Mm -hmm. And at that in the 70s, it was the largest flight attendant union in the world. We repped 25 different carriers, from Aloha Airlines to United. And little New York Airways Council, 21 was in there. <laughs> 16 votes, four. <laughs> and uh, they, um, AFA was an offshoot of the Airline Pilots Association Steward and Stewardess Division. When the Boeing 747 came along, traditionally, the pilots elected a male pilot as the president of ALPA, and the stewardesses elected the vice president of ALPA, and we behaved ourselves traditionally. But then you have 1969 comes along, the Equal Opportunity Act. Now you can't get rid of us because we are old, <laughs> or we're married, or we're pregnant. <laughs> And so we're hanging in there, and the average seniority when I started in 65 of a flight attendant, uh, or the, the longevity, was 18 months. And then the, the women got married or, or whatever. And, uh, or, you, or you hit the age of 32, and that was the quitting time. A lot of the airlines uh, overlooked that with some of their, their good, good stewardesses and just kept them on. So anyhow, it was growing the, the uh, SNS division and when the 747 came along well now we're going to have 10 a minimum of 10 flight attendants in the cabin and two pilots up front maybe three or four on international flights well the pilots it, we, and we had our convention at the same time we were in one convention room the pilots were in another convention room and we'd have dinner dances together and stuff like that well we were in Fort Lauderdale and it was uh, when when the and the 747 is is out and, and and working, and these pilots came to us and they said, "Well, now you know what, ladies. We think you should go autonomous of Alpha. Well, we can't afford it. We don't make as much money as you guys, and we can't afford to have a research department and all this other stuff." Oh, now don't worry about that. We will subsidize you, but you need to go off and form your own separate union. <laughs> Their concern was that one day, 
all this huge number of stewardesses are going to say, you know what, we need a woman as the president of ALPA. And there's no way those pilots are going to have a woman as ALPA. <laughs> right? So we went, we went autonomous. And in that process, uh, AFA was building up a staff. We traditionally used to have the negotiators for the contracts uh, come out of ALPA. And so they would do the pilot's contract, and then they'd move over and do the stewardess's contract. We got the leftovers. And so we said, well, we're independent, right? So we need our own negotiators, and we need to have flight attendants negotiating flight attendant contracts. And they went through all their 25 contracts, and there's a little New York Airways, 28-page contract, but we have stuff in there the big airlines never heard of. <laughs> Overtime after 75 hours, we had a maximum of 85 hours a month flying or 125 hours on-duty time. And we would run out of on-duty time before we ran out of flight time. So the flight attendants always flew one day less than the pilots. They didn't have this on-duty stuff. And they were looking at this, and the company was buying our shoes. The company was buying our, our uh, nylons, and these things ripped notoriously. <laughs> and so they said, who negotiated this contract? Well, you look at the signature page, and it's always the same three people. Lanny Chevalier, Gabrielle Hartman, Raina Scholten. <laughs> so they approached the three of us to be to come as negotiators for AFA. And the other two ladies said no, they weren't interested. And so I went and I was being paid as if I was flying for New York Airways. I would ghost bid a schedule, but another girl would fly it. And I would get paid whatever she made. And uh, plus, they paid the company a 25% differential for uh, benefits. And so my first assignment was Aloha Airlines. Mm -hmm. And then they became my account in Hawaiian. And Texas International was one negotiations, 18 months. <laughs> wow. Ozark. Yeah, the airlines, uh, the contracts don't expire. And they work under the Railway uh, Labor Act and your contract becomes amendable, but does not expire. So 60 days prior to the amendable date, you write a letter of intent. We would like to change certain things in the contract. And then the company, I mean, it's, they, have to, they have to agree to it. They, and they, they write back, we want to change some stuff too. And of course, they want to reduce the, increase the hours, reduce the pay, reduce benefits. But that isn't what you're spending most of your time on. Uh, you're, you're at the negotiating table. Most of the time is, of all things, uniforms, which I thought was ridiculous. Certain safety items. There's an actual safety uh, section in a, in a stewardess contract or a flight attendant contract. And I said, I said after I got, you know, my sea legs as a negotiator, I said, I'm, si I am, I'm embarrassed for you. Well, what do you mean, the company? I said, I'm sitting here and I'm negotiating a safety item on your aircraft. I said, aren't you ashamed of yourself? I said, I'm negotiating what what your flight attendants should wear. They're going to make they're representing your airline and I have to negotiate that we want new new suits. <laughs> we don't want to look like ragamuffins. So I'm embarrassed for you. <laughs> and then the last ten ten percent of the negotiations are money items. And that goes very quickly. But the airlines are interested in going as far as possible beyond the amendable date because to get retroactive is very difficult. And you never get 100% retroactive, even if, if you do get retroactive pay. So they make money by dragging the negotiations out. What do you think the future of the airline industry is today? It's going to be one or two US carriers, do you think? Yeah, it's, uh, and then these little feeder things, maybe. But they all have these these uh, 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 what, economic partnerships, where SkyWest is Delta, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they're getting fewer and fewer. An airline has to exist, but of course, an arm and a leg to to run the thing. In my day, when I was when I was flying, when I first started to negotiate, you had the like a pilot or somebody from the maintenance department through the Peter principle making it up to the top you know not a businessman 
uh, I really, you know, I've been out of it such a long time, I don't know who's, who's running. I, I, I hear, like, some of the same names, but... I mean, Lorenzo was the first, Frank Lorenzo of Texas International. Oh, this guy was evil. But, <laughs> but he, he said, you know, I'm just the messenger of the future. This is the reality of it. We have to get mo more productivity and less cost. And you people, you know, labor was 32% of the, of the cost of the airline business. <laughs> so, but he was a tough guy. He, but they brought, he brought down a guy from uh, U.S. Air from Pittsburgh, moved his family, bought a house in Houston, the whole thing. The guy wasn't there. He was a nice man. I said, oh, well, we have half a chance of maybe, you know, getting a, a deal and fast. And all of a sudden, he was, it had a Greek name, and he disappeared. And I said, where'd that nice guy go? He said, he swims with the fishes, you know? Because <laughs> there was a rumor that Lorenzo was connected, you know, and that they, the, the mafiosos put him through Harvard Business School and all that. He's the guy. <laughs> Pan Am always wanted a domestic route. That was the thing that was holding they they felt was holding them back from being a worldwide airline, and they were prohibited for you know this goes back to Howard Hughes and and, and the Aviator and the the Senator Brewster and all that business and and Juan Tripp. Yeah. And they said you can go everywhere you want to go. But you're not flying inside the United States, and of course, Pan Am always wanted the route, and that's why they bought, they bought 49% of our stock, is they thought, we're going to start this, we're going to get in with this little helicopter airline off the Pan Am building, then Sikorsky's and 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 Boeing are going to build these big machines that are going to carry 50, 60 people, and we're going to go downtown. Uh, Manhattan, downtown Boston, downtown Philadelphia, and downtown Washington. They're calling you. <laughs> Diane? Yeah. Oh, it's 2.30, it's 2 o'clock now. Oh, it's 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. Okay, thanks. Okay. No, thank you. <laughs> Someone has a toothache. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no. have a, fu a funeral to go to at 2.30 oh, today. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, um, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah. That was the, that's why they came to New York Airways. They thought this was their step into the into the domestic route, and then Lorenzo came and took over what was then Trans Texas, flew across the border into Mexico so he could call himself Texas International, changed the name of the airline, changed the paint jobs, got got bigger uh, the little the short DC nines, and uh, said. A national Airlines was in financial trouble at the time. And uh, so Franks announced that Texas International is going to merge with National Airlines. And Pan Am got excited because they had tried a merger with Northeast and failed. And they were playing, They were their next move was to go for National Airlines. So a bidding war started. The stock of National Airlines went up like nobody's business. Lorenzo had tons of it. <laughs> and at the last minute, he sells his stock and says, I'm not interested in merging, and Pan Am was stuck with this losing national airlines who was in f terrible financial shape, and that started. Mm. And then, of course, Lockerbie finished it. The descent wow. of Pan Am. I'm going to turn this over to Jack. Just oh. stay where you oh, are. Okay. <laughs> You're okay. And, um, and he'll finish you up. And, All right. Um, then you'll need to get together with Bob and see if he scanned all that uh, stuff. We need to get a uh, yeah, he'll together. be out here. The other one was canceled. Oh, okay, that's fine. So he he has till five o'clock. So we're in good shape. I want to know how to take this, uh, how to change this. Okay. Um, you, you've got another yeah, forty minutes right. on here, so yeah, uh, we'll, we'll you get, just we'll, hit this first and put it on pause. This little thing here. And my fingers. Yeah. Okay. You pull that. Okay. Pull that, that down, down, and that comes out. Okay. And um, then you just I'll grab one. I'll get. I'll get another one out for you. I can just okay. right there. Right there. That's a new one. Yeah. Let's those are done. Those are ones that we already it. did. Okay. So. Raina, hey, thanks, dear, for coming Thank you so much. So I'll get together with you, and we'll. <laughs> okay. All right. I, mean, I think I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think you did. <laughs> and I'll have a DVD for you, and think about it. I can make more for you. Just let me know how oh, many you might want. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you. Stuff like that. <laughs> and I'll just, I'll just leave this all here, Jack. Okay. So we'll handle it from here and take off. Okay. Let me grab.
sure have my. <coughs> Where did you? Uh, how did you? How far did we get? Well, she's taught. Yeah, she she became a negotiator after her uh -huh. flying days. So right. we were just talking about. That's what we were yeah. just talking okay. about. Okay. Around what, 1980 or 1977? 1977, I went with the Association of Flight Attendants as a staff negotiator. And they were uh, the biggest flight attendant union in the world at the yes. time. Yes, is that right? Yeah, we had 25 airlines from Aloha to United. And your particular job? My was a negotiator, contract negotiator. Oh, between them. Uh -huh. Based on the contract that I was on the team uh, for about three contracts at New York Airways. and. We had a little 28-page contract, but with jewels in it that United didn't even have. <laughs> but, uh, so that was good. Yeah, yeah. And we were, we were beloved. I mean, we were part of the union. We were Council 21, 16 flight attendants. We had 16 votes, you know. <laughs> Where were you living then? I was living in, um, all right, I was living first in uh, Flushing, New York. And then uh, I married one of the pilots, and we bought a house uh, halfway out Long Island in Smithtown, a place called Hop Hog. Hop Hog. Hop Hog. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Indian name. Uh, near Islip Airport. And Paul was a captain for New York Airways, and he was a captain of the Navy Reserves. Good. But the marriage failed after five and a half years. Oh. <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. You know. Was and you uh, And you worked? For this, uh, for the airlines, right? For how long? For uh, from uh, December '65 till May of '79, when the airline went out of when, business. Okay. And I was, as a matter of fact, I was in St. Louis when I got the word that it's shutting down. And so on my next break from the negotiations with Ozark, I went back to New York to say goodbye to my airplanes, my helicopters. Well, you still had plenty of years yet. For a career. Oh yes, yes, yes. So I've <coughs> stayed with the Association of Flight Attendants until 1983, and then started uh, the mergings of the airlines and all this. And and uh, we were on a austerity program at AFA, and so the junior negotiator, no matter how good you did, your it all went by seniority. So I was furloughed in '83. And furloughed meaning. Uh, laid off, laid off, but with potential of being called back, and uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. I collected unemployment for about eighteen months, and California did not object because the unemployment was being paid by Washington D.C., where the headquarters of the union is located. Now you were living then in in Hermosa Beach. <laughs> when did you move? Uh, All right. Did, why did? Let me ask you this. <coughs> Excuse me. Why did you? Uh, how did you come, and why? Yeah. To California. Okay, and in, uh, when I joined, when AFA picked me up as a negotiator, uh, my first assignment was Aloha Airline. I mean Hawaiian Airlines in Honolulu. You go to where the airline headquarters is. So I spent four months negotiating that contract, and it was my first one. And AFA had promised me that I was going to get training at the George Meany Training Center, that I was going to go with another negotiator and get experience watching the other negotiator. And that was promised me in July of 77. And on September 3rd, 77, they called me up and said, get ready, you're going to Honolulu. And I said, training, wing it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You have a talent for it. <laughs> but <laughs> no. no, I must have training. <laughs> you know, I have this German background. I need a manual. I need, you know, to study. <laughs> and then I do it. <laughs> no, wing it. So I went out there, and the morning, uh, the first morning of the negotiations, when you're meeting the company committee. Now you've already worked with the, with your own. There are always three flight attendants who volunteer to come onto these committees. It's a non-pay thing. Uh, they get paid some expenses. That's about it. But uh, they make the decisions. You're simply the mouthpiece, because they cannot bite the hand that feeds them. And I can say all sorts of nasty, you know. <laughs> sure. Ugly things to the company and sure. a, no reprimand on my people. Good guy, bad guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So and and they cannot they don't speak. They just send notes and, and advise me on what I'm doing and all this other you know, if I'm going the wrong way or what the heck are you doing, you know? Caucus. <laughs> so but 
Hawaiian Airlines that year hadn't hired a professional negotiating company that uh, negotiated about 150 contracts in the islands. It was the Hawaiian Employers Council. So their, their version of the union. And there was a man sitting across the table, a guy by the name of Al Fraga, who was an employee of this negotiating company. And within two seconds he saw that I was, you know, I was new, this was my first time ever doing this, and that I was scared. I mean, I was brushing my teeth that morning and I threw up. I was so, <laughs> so scared. And so uh, the president of the union, a woman by the name of Pat Robertson, she was at the table and does this, you know, we have, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but, you know, our, our terrific staff person here is diligent and very clever and you guys will get along just wonderfully, goodbye. And off she goes. <laughs> <laughs> not going on, right. no. Right. You know, now first of all, I have to bluff, uh, not necessarily bluff, but I have to show uh, some fortitude in front of my team because they're relying on me to get things for them, right. you know. And then I have to try to cover up that this guy doesn't realize that I don't know what the heck I'm doing. But he did realize it, and his he had a choice. He's he's either going to eat me, uh, chew me up, and eat me out, and spit me out and they're gonna send somebody else. Or he can very cleverly walk me through all the palava of negotiations, the rituals, why timing is important when you caucus, you know? Why this is important, why that's important, what you're signaling. And the guy did this in such a kind, gentle way that I actually learned how to do my, my job through him. Is that right? And then I went on to my, when I went on to other contracts, uh, they thought, well, she's wonderful. You know? that something? And of course, I got back to Washington, they said, you see, we told you, wing it, you did it. <laughs> I said, you did, fools. Did you ever tell this gentleman? Of course. Yeah. Not, not after that initial negotiation, because we had other ones to come. But we have, uh, when you reach a deal, uh, of course, we're the underlings. The guys who say, yes, this is, a, a, sure. is an okay contract or not, are the presidents of the union and the president of the airline. And, uh, and more rituals, and then the signing sure. uh, thing, and then the dinner following. And the president of Hawaiian Airlines at that time, a guy by the name of Magoon, had, was a member of the Honolulu uh, Country Club, and so that's where the dinner was. And there was a, I went out to the bathroom at one point, and came back out in the hallway, and there is this guy, Al Fraga, and there's a pineapple worker, union man, talking with him. And he, and he looked at me, and, uh, and Fraga said, oh, this is Raina, she's from the flight attendants union, you know. And he said, this is the greatest guy. And I said, yes, he is. <laughs> you know, he's wonderful. <laughs> but, uh, Did you ever have a chance to see him after that? I saw, yeah, I saw him uh, two years later when the contract became amendable for Hawaiian, so we sat at the table again, only he was letting his junior man get more and more. Sure. The The first negotiations, Bob, was the scribe, and now he was actually doing a lot of the talking. It's amazing when you're in a particular area, what you can say to a young yeah, uh, yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. coming up that makes all yeah. the difference in the world. Oh, absolutely. I mean, for the next eight years, I, it was easy. There Did was you no then help some of the new people come along? What happened was, you no, know, I, I was furloughed, and then oh, yeah. nothing, 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 and then they, uh, the unemployment went out after 18 months, and uh, even though I sent out resumes, there was no reaction. And by then I was pretty much, no, nah, I could give up all this flying around all the time and living in hotel rooms, because that's all you do. Yeah. And uh, so a friend of mine was a dog groomer in Hermosa, in Hermosa Beach. The front part of her store was a couple of bags of dog food and some leashes and it was dusty and dirty and nasty and I used to take my my Yorkie my two little Yorkie dogs to be groomed by Bonnie and so we were talking one day she said so what are you retired now and I said yeah I'm not doing anything and I was looking around the shop and I said you know Bonnie this shop really looks crappy up front and she said well do something about it and I said hey why don't I do retail in the front part you know, I'll remodel the store, just dog and cat supplies, that's all, and kind of, you know, and I'll, we'll go in business, because she was the draw, she was a champion dog groomer, and there were these dogs coming from Manhattan Beach and all over the place, you know, and we didn't realize how much money there was going to be in the animal business. Yeah. What it is today is unbelievable. It is. 
and I was way ahead, you know, with the little uh, t-shirts for the dog, anything, the more human you could make it look, the more they bought it. And I had a good distributor who helped me put the shelves up and told me what pro how to place the products. You put the chewy stuff at the bottom so when the dog walks in, he grabs it and then the guy has to pay 79 cents. <laughs> so I did that for a few years. And then uh, I, I messed around now, with... The, you were in, uh, when I first came in here and now, you were in Hawaii. Oh, okay. And then you came back to... Well, oh, so I'm You were laid off where? Yeah, from Hawaii? Uh, uh, no, from Hermosa Beach, because... Or I'm sorry, I, I went way ahead of myself. So, 77 September, I'm in Hawaii with the first negotiations. Right. And I'm <laughs> being trained by the, <laughs> by the company rep. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Jan so the contract uh, finished, and they voted, they voted it in, the flight attendants, 98%. Wow. So... Uh, it flew, and then uh, I came back to Washington, D.C. to debrief, and then they said, Aloha wants you. They requested you. Hawaiian has taught, uh, the flight attendants of Hawaiian said, they love Reina. <laughs> so the Aloha Good. flight attendants uh, requested me, and I went back to Hawaii. And in 78, the Today program was taped and then flown into Hawaii, and you watched it the next morning. Oh. You know, it was... Okay. No satellites, yeah. nothing. We didn't even have, I don't, uh, we had a Xerox machine. We were excited about the Xerox machine. We Xeroxed everything in triplicate. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I'm sitting in, and it was February or March, 78, and I'm sitting and I'm watching the Today Show as I'm getting ready to go to work, and there's a snowstorm blizzard in New York like nobody's business, and I said, well, I'm going to be living out of a suitcase from now on. You know, so why why should I go back to New York? And at a restaurant in Honolulu one evening when I was having dinner by myself, at the table next to me there were some United stewardesses and they were talking, you know, and, and the one girl noticed that I was eavesdropping and she said, we're with United Airlines, my name is Carol, what's your name? And I said, my name is Raina and I'm with the Association of Flight Attendants. Oh, well that's our union, we own it, because they were the biggest group. <laughs> And they said, come on over and have coffee. And we, I made friends with these stewardesses. So whenever they flew into Honolulu, I had somebody to have dinner with and stuff like that. And they were all L.A. based. And they said, don't go back to New York. Move out here. You know? So when I finished with Aloha, that was May or June. And again, the same procedure, back to Washington debrief. Okay. And then there was a gap of what my next assignment would be. And uh, so I just got beacons movers and they moved most of my stuff and I packed up the rest of it and my 1977 Monte Carlo I had enough room for me to sit in the car and was loaded to the gunnels and drove across the United States. On 66? 78, 1978. So on route 66. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I should have. I should have, you know. Uh, but no, I took the major, the major of highways and um, uh, I was in, where did I stop one time? I think I, was it the first night in Pittsburgh or something, or Indiana or someplace I stopped, and I checked in with AFA, you know, the, what's, what's up for me? And they said, where are you? I said, well, I'm in Indiana. They said, drop down to St. Louis and go over to the field office and meet with the Ozark Airline Flight Attendant, uh, Master Executive Council, we call them. They're like the local reps. And um, so I, I stopped in in St. Louis, presented myself to the MEC chairperson who would have been the local president, and uh, we chatted and she said, I've been talking to Hawaiian and Aloha and I'd like you to do our next negotiations. And we start in September. <laughs> and this was end of July, beginning of August, and I said, I'll be back. <laughs> I settled myself in, in Hermosa Beach, got a roommate, a United stewardess as a, as a Do you roommate. you remember the address of the place uh, in Hermosa Beach? Mm, no, it was, no, the first one was Manhattan Beach, then I went to Hermosa. Ugh, I, I popped around from one apartment to another there. Because, right. I mean, you get assigned, when you go to the islands, you are there. You're not coming back on the weekend. So I put things in storage and then just you know, whatever fit in the oh, suitcase went with me. I and I lived in the hotel for four or five months. And then I'd come back and, and uh, yeah, so mostly I hung around with United flight attendants. They were always looking for roommates and things like that. And then went off to Ozark 
and did I did come back on a couple of weekends, you know, because I had an apartment and so I came to visit my things <laughs> to take a break, and uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and then, just kind of, you know. And you went then to Ozark. Ozark. Out of uh, living, Rack? pardon? Out of Little Rock. Uh, no, Ozark was St. Louis. Oh, St. Louis. St. Louis, Missouri, was their home oh, base. Right. They called it the fort. They had these little slit windows because of tornadoes. <laughs> and I lived at the Best Western on I-75 for, I think it was 11 months. That contract took 11 months. And. Then how, you just went from then, contract yes, to contract. Yes, you finish one contract, you debrief, and all of a sudden, you need to go to Texas. <laughs> you need to go to Texas International. Well, you know, and then in between there are things like, uh, oh God, Braniff, Har Lawrence Harding, this guy, was the president and the CEO of Braniff. He was a drunk. No hmm. points. No, no two ways. He's dead now, so no problems in talking about him. But um, they went. They went through. Alpa staff, the, the, the reps from the Airline Pilots Association. Then they went through a couple of staff from AFA, you know, us flight attendant kind. And as I was coming back from uh, the second Aloha contract, uh, I, may be, I may be mixing myself up here. It may have been the first one. I get to Los Angeles and I'm changing, I'm going to change to another aircraft to go to Washington DC and then back home to New York uh, and I get uh, Raina Shulton please pick up the white courtesy phone at the United Terminal so I pick up the white courtesy phone and they said it was headquarters my boss the contract uh, uh, head and she said uh, uh, it was Friday, so she said, stay over in Los Angeles for the weekend, which was great because I had flown in with two f United friends who were working the flight, and they were pestering me, don't go, don't go to Washington till Monday, you know, nobody's there, where are you going to Washington, you know, stay with us, we'll have some fun. And uh, so I, I got a hold of it, I said, they're keeping me here <laughs> for the weekend. And so I said, what happens after the weekend? Well, you're going to Braniff. Not as the negotiator. They'd been in negotiations for four years or something, and they th was horrendous. Ter they were eating negotiators. And they said, no, 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 you're going to go as the support. You're going to do some uh, support work, you know, uh, agitate the, f the public about what's going on with the, the brand of flight attendants, that how badly they're being treated. Well, one of the tactics is uh, informational picketing at the airport. You, s you put up a picket line, and it looks like they're on strike, but it's informational. It's just to let you know how badly Braniff is treating us, you know? And um, one yeah. of our slogan, they, and Lawrence Harding had painted the airplanes of Braniff different colors, remember that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then they had that Calder one that was painted white with all sorts of designs on it. That's artist Calder, he was a maniac. <laughs> God, and the yeah. big orange 747 always flew to Honolulu, <laughs> right? So they said, no, it's okay, support work. And report into the field, to the Alpa field office, we have a room there, you know, a conference room for the flight attendants. So I go down there, introduce myself, and I call up Washington. I said, okay, I'm here. And they said, okay, uh, we're going to do a march around the Blue Barn, which was the headquarters for Braniff, and uh, write a song that the marchers can sing that's going to be easy, <laughs> a chant. <laughs> you know? So I went into the conference room, and I'm trying to produce a chant which will be easy for anywhere from 200 to 500 flight attendants oh, wow. to learn quickly and sing in unison <laughs> as they march around the blue barn right <laughs> so I'm in there and I I got I uh, composed something and I went out and the secretaries are there and said can I run this past you <laughs> they go no no too complicated go back <laughs> so, and so I, I made I, I did it and then organized the pick, this information, this picketing around the barn. And one flight attendant had a husband who flew the airplane that had trails the advertising, you know? Yes, right. So they said, he, he's, he's willing to fly around the barn a couple of times. What do you want him to say? You know, so we're sitting there. What should he say? What should he say? There is no green and brand of colors. <laughs> you know, so this thing's flying around. You know? I mean, I read Catherine Graham's biography, and she said 
not that she was such a clever woman, but how lucky she was, mm. you know? And I say the same thing. Mm -hmm. What what a stroke yeah. of luck that this woman has a pilot, you know, husband sure. who flies its advertising yeah. thing. AFA said, how'd you do that show? What does it cost us? It's not going to cost us anything. Don't worry about it. Well, now, uh, <laughs> Rennie, uh, do you remember how that chant went? No. Come on. I don't, I'm not going to do it. No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Right. I sincerely, I sincerely okay. don't remember the thing. I wanted to forget it as fast as possible. <laughs> and I bribed one very senior stewardess. Oh, she was an old, old hide. <laughs> she came up to me and I said, Pick it, because the more, the more seniority, the more more striking it is for the management. They, sure. Because the the older flight attendants tend to be a little bit conservative, you know. Mm -hmm. I had one one United one was she was <coughs> to the right of the John Birch Society. This one, you know, I'm not joining any goddamn union. I mean, you're gonna have to pay a service fee because you are getting certain things as a result of our work, you know. I don't mind paying the service fee, but I'm not joining any goddamn union. And I got her to pick it in front of United once. And, go, and the, the supervisors came out of the terminal and go, Mamie? Mamie Brenneman? Is that <laughs> you right? know? And yeah. they go, oh my God, yeah. this union must be something. <laughs> That's amazing, uh, the, the, the career. How long then did you go on representing the various? I did uh, seven, seven to eight years, I did negotiations. Seven to eight years. Yeah, and mostly it was always the same group. I, it, they were like my accounts. That was the Texas International, the Ozark, Hawaiian Airlines, Aloha, okay. and then okay. I did one, a uh, couple of side letter of agreements with other carriers, and I cleaned up one, one. It, the contract wasn't bad, but the staff negotiator had been so exhausted, on what we call the road shows, explaining what they had gotten in the contract that the flight attendants took it as a signal that she wanted them to vote it down so she could go back get, and get more. And it is in the Constitution and Bylaws of AFA that we will not agree to a contract unless we feel we have gotten everything possibly that we could get. And we will not go back and try to get more because it will set precedence on all the following negotiations. Sure, sure. You know, because these guys will sure. just say, right. well, I don't care if they get me a million bucks, right. I'm voting no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. And it wasn't always money, it was other uh, training uh, Perks, uh, things, uh, holding, uh, you know, how, mostly working condition stuff. Uh, so the money is 10% of the contract, very small. Mm -hmm. you know. but, uh, well, and and then I, when I, when I was uh, laid off or furloughed, and then I went into business at the Bauer Boutique, <laughs> that's what Bonnie mm -hmm. and I called our place in Hermosa. And that was going great guns, and then I got involved with the, with somebody in a in a small motel in Phoenix. I know a lot about the motel business. I stayed in a few. <laughs> so even after you're finished with these negotiating teams, you're still kind of bouncing around as a vagabond. Oh no no yeah, no no no. Um, I have I have moved bag and baggage into Hermosa Beach, and I'm living there. Okay. That's my home. And when I negotiate, I'm like. The Hawaiians were unusual because it was such a, a long travel time that to come home on the weekend is five hours. Sure, okay. And it's uh, and, and and at terrible times of the, you know you'd have to take the red eye, and so to to commute back and forth to your home is impossible. Whereas yeah. when you're working a contract on the mainland, you can commute back and home every weekend. And then that's easier. Yeah. How long would uh, an average negotiation take for you sitting at a table? Can go. Uh, it, uh, well, mine were the the easiest ones were the two Hawaiian groups. I don't know. It's the mentality of living on a small island, and you see each other all the time, so there isn't all this nonsense going on. But as I was explaining to Dr. Thompson, the uh, airline contracts are come under the Railway Labor Act. There are there is no contract that expires. They become amendable. So in other words, they continue to run past the amendable date. But the amendable date is there so that it, it'll run for two years usually. And 60 days prior to the amendable date, you can write a letter of intent that you would like to change certain things in the contract. And then the negotiations begin. And then you have direct negotiations for it may how, uh, United flight attendants went into a five-year negotiations one time. Of course, this was post Ronald Reagan, and so replacements were an issue. So 
strike was like the last thing you're going to try to do to try to get an agreement and you have to go direct negotiations until finally you hit an impasse and the both of you have to say that you are at an impasse mm -hmm. and then at that point you can apply to the National Mediation Board mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get a mediator and he keeps you running until he thinks you're obnoxious and you're not going to do anything nobody's moving and then he can put you into a 30-day cooling off period and that is the only time the clock runs so I've been I uh, Ozark was uh, 14 months Texas International uh, when I was the full-time well, negotiator was 17 months now were you involved in anything that had to do with the uh, those in the flight con controllers no uh, back maybe 20 was it yeah yeah 70s? that was in the 70s I was still I was still a yeah. stewardess at that time oh, and what we didn't understand I forgotten <coughs> I forgotten the the president's name of Patco at that time and th no that was Ronald Reagan so it was 1980 it had to be about 1980 no okay yeah, yeah very yeah, likely 80 81 must have been around very that time very likely okay so I wasn't I was already with the union um, what we didn't understand is in previous years when Patco had trouble with, with the government negotiating, what they did is they went by the book. And by the book means three minutes separation between landing and taking off, and all these other things that can delay flights like nobody's business. And they would do this stuff and cause all these delays. And of course, then the airlines, because it was costing the airlines money, delays cost them money, they would pressure the government to settle with Patco. And then you'd get a contract and everybody was happy and and plus by law they were they were not not supposed to be able to strike it was in their contract and no strike clause and this maniac in 80 or 81 this president of PACO and he came to ALPA and he came to AFA and said I'm gonna go on strike and I want you to support it and ALPA said no it's an illegal strike you know why don't you do your woe program work without enthusiasm you know and they go no 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 I want to go on strike and they said well, it's not a good idea and we couldn't believe it. He said, that guy's bluffing. He's bluffing. He's, it's the stupidest thing to do, is to take these people on strike. And then we said, these people are college-educated people, these tower people. They're, they know better than to do this. But now, you get a leader, you can make them do anything. You know, I, I, I took the Ozark flight attendants out on strike for 40 days. It was the scariest thing. And what was particularly was scary so. is that you stand in an auditorium in front of 500 of these people, and you're talking, they're, they're out of work, they're not making any money, you're getting paid because you're a staff person, you know, and you're telling them to hang in there, we're going to win, <laughs> you know, and they're, and they're going, okay, divorces are in process because some of them are married to management. Pilots are angry at them because the pilots are sympathetic to the flight attendants and, you know, and you're... And you just say certain words, and they go with you, and they love you, and they th go, Raina, we're behind you. And I go, oh, my God, you know? Well, anyway, we were successful. It was the la first and last <laughs> successful strike at Ozark. And then, and then this Patco thing happened. And, uh, I mean, when, when I came to, uh, when, when I got the news, you know, that this guy had done this at 5.30 in the morning, we sat there. It, this is crazy. The military is going to come in and man the towers. You know, we're not going to stop flying. Yeah. And uh, they never and that never was resolved. No. And then Reagan came up with this famous word, <coughs> replacements. Yeah. And so they sued and said, no, you can't make you can't put in replacements. <gasps> well, excuse me, it's the Republican government, and, and yeah. all the courts are going, yes, he can. Yeah. And then we turn around and said, well, there goes our last weapon. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to be at the table a long time. And I, I mean, I, I totally did. I, I was on Reagan's side on that one. Mm -hmm. And I voted for the man, too. I mean, we had mm -hmm. such craziness just by, before him. Yeah. You know, so at least he brought dignity and, 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 and pride in the yeah, country. Uh, that was a tough one. I had some good friends who were tower people who yeah, uh, yeah. were laid off. Yeah, you know, yeah, never came yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. Never did come back. Oh, it was... Mm -mm -mm. Uh, let me uh, <laughs> just go back and uh, pick up something that uh, <clears throat> your parents were still living and mm -hmm. traveling mm -hmm. between New York and the various places while you were a stewardess. 
and right. even after when you got into negotiations. Right. Uh, what did they have to think about what you were doing at this particular point in time? Uh, okay. At some point, uh, these contracts that my father is getting, he did work for USAID. Oh. And, and he did work for other governments. I mean, he worked for the Thai government to try to uh, improve the productivity of the Thai, Thai farmer. And uh, he worked for other cons consulting. He had a consulting company, but he would, you know, work for other folks. And so it became uh, in 1960, about 64, 65, they decided that they should base themselves in, in Bangkok, Thailand. Yeah. That this was, he had a very uh, long three or four year contract, uh, a three year contract with USAID in, in, in Thailand. And so he said, well, we might as well just settle down here in Thailand. And then they loved it so much because they were small. My parents were not the big, you know, normal sized American of the 60s. You in know? stature. Yeah, in stature. And uh, so and my mother said, the Thais, they like us because we are little like them. <laughs> And they just, they, my father always loved uh, travel. I mean, even, even as a boy, he and his mother loved to travel. His twin brother and his father were not such great travelers. But anyhow, so they were based in Bangkok and uh, uh, working for New York Airways. Since we were not a competitor of any airline, we actually brought passengers to them. We had pass privileges that far exceeded any other group in the, in the industry. Well, we had we had past deals with China Airlines, you know, wow. and everybody gave us sure. a, a freebie. You know, I could well, fly well. around the world on TWA for one hundred and forty nine dollars. Now the only thing was I was flying on standby, which in those days wasn't bad. I mean, no. I, I'd hate to do it today, but no. um, so I was I was you know I always had one month off every year, vacation. And it, and it grew as my seniority grew. It got to be you know six, uh, five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks off. Of course, you'd break it up. You what did you do on these tri on these times? Well, for the one month, I basically would find out where my parents were and go and visit. And, visit. <laughs> yeah. and, and then were, I made little side trips with my. And pals. they were delighted to see you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> my my mother was funny. They uh, she I was in Thailand. I think I was in Bangkok about three weeks, and she said to me. Renushka, my heart is heavy for when you are going, but when are you going? <laughs> I, said, I can oh, take a hint. That's you know? cute. <laughs> when I stop flying, of course, this in the helicopter you're landing and taking off. You're up and down, running up and down the aisle. It's very physical work. And then in the summertime, no air conditioning. It's a flying sauna. <laughs> you know? I mean, we got up to 115 degrees in the cabin sometimes. <laughs> and, we, and we only found that out because the union said, we're putting a thermometer up. You people are working under horrendous conditions. And then we said, leave us alone. You know, they always kept pestering in on some of the good stuff we were doing. <laughs> but uh, well, we got a heat relief store and that negotiations, you know. So they brought in a reserve when you got to, in a 10-hour shift, you got to go off for one hour and sit quietly in the air-conditioned terminal. And get paid for it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And then you always try to get them to put it up against your lunch hour, you know, so you got like two hours off. <laughs> and, but they had this one girl, uh, Kathy Collins, ah, she was a hoot, that one. All for mostly foreigners, a uh, couple of Ameri uh, born Americans worked for New York Airways because of the language business. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end they said, oh, the heck with it, everybody speaks English. Uh, the German girl. And Kathy Collins had relieved me and had relieved the extra section flight attendant, and now she's going to leave, relieve Gabrielle, the last one. So she's been going for two hours straight, right? And she's got a sweat going and, you know, getting beginning to look a little frazzled. And Gabrie I, I walked out with her. I was going to my helicopter, and here comes Gabrielle's helicopter. And they shut down, and they open up the door, and Gabrielle stands there. I mean, she looked like she came out of a bandbox not a hair out of place. She is not sweating. She's not doing anything. And Kathy says, and I'm relieving her? And she said, she's on those pills that Walter Slezak took on Lifeboat. You remember the movie Lifeboat with Tallulah Bankhead? The, the, the ship gets torpedoed by Germans. And then Slezak is one of the uh, crewmen that worked in the engine room or something. And everybody's kind of like, well, you know, and a couple of days go by and they're, they haven't eaten and the supplies are minimal and they're all kind of droopy, droopy. And 
they talk Tallulah Bankhead into taking her diamond bracelet off so they can catch fish with it as a lure. You know? yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a Go great ahead. film. And Slezak just keeps rowing this big lifeboat, you know, and he never wears out. Well, it ends up he's got some vitamins or something he's taking, you know, <laughs> some pet pills. <laughs> so Kathy Collins, being a great cinema kind of <laughs> expert, she said, I swear that woman's taking those pills. Look at her. And I'm relieving her. Look at me. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> and uh, your folks then? I oh yeah, they're, they're traveling. I so I would catch. Uh, yeah, I would just catch up with them with wherever they were, and on a rare occasion, they really didn't come through New York. I mean, and of course, I was in Los Angeles, and nah, they were doing their thing. They were out there. You know, I'm a grown-up lady. And they finally. Uh, the, uh, the last contract was in Guinea, West Africa was a big one for my father, was an uh, independent one, and he made good money on that one. And uh, they then decided, that's enough now. Let's, let's call it quits and we retire. So in 1983, they repatriated to the United States, and then is the decision. Do we go to Los Angeles, where Reina is, or do we go to Florida, where Ermush and George, the Hungarian and, and my mother's sister, they're in Tampa, or Clearwater, and my father's twin brother is in Miami. And my mother said, Erwin, don't go to California, because we haven't been around Reina that much, and we will sit on her neck, and she has her own life to live, you know? We go to Florida, so they went to Clearwater. And, Which uh, was okay with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was still, uh, you know, flying around and doing my negotiations sure, and things like sure. that, so I... Instead of going home to California on the weekend, I'd fly down and visit. When did you my, end your ne end your negotiating career? I was in '83, I think '82, '83. I was uh, furloughed, laid off, with the intent of bringing me back. And then, 18 months went by, and they never called me back. It didn't look like they were airlines were nego were merging. The union was uh, was having financial difficulties, you know. So they were trying to keep everything on bare bones. And so I went into the Bauer boutique business, <laughs> and then the motel in Phoenix, which was, oh God, it ate all my money, because oh. it's seasonal. And I, what do I know from, you know, we had managers for a 40-room motel, and I had an Austrian friend, a guy who immigrated to the United States, and he, he made it, to, he parlayed uh, $80,000 into a couple of million. Guy was, he worked for IBM, he was a very clever man. And he had a big roadway in on Grand Avenue near the industry, industrial part of Phoenix. We're down on Van Buren, next to the Garden of Gears used car lot. Oh my, and I, you know, I was the silent partner who just gave the money. <laughs> Almost, and it, it broke, happens. I mean, it, 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 yeah, it broke me. But it does, it was an experience. What got, did you do then? Uh, well, I've got the, the boutique, <laughs> and then Bonnie decides that she's going to retire from dog grooming because we were all now getting into our fifties, right? And uh, and I was rooming. Uh, I was uh, sharing a house with a with a school teacher who was came from a wealthy family, you know. And, and my father was giving me an allowance to keep me going, you know, and stuff like that. So I really didn't have to hustle for work. Yeah. And uh, but then AFA called me up in in 1988, and uh, they had a consulting company come in and said, the problem with the with AFA is that it is from the East Coast out to the Hawaiian Islands. And maybe in the future we'll be go we'll go global, you know. And your communications with your membership is lacking because you don't have any central point in these air like on the East Coast and the Midwest and on the West Coast. So what you need are field service representatives. And these people will do troubleshooting, training for different committees because these flight attendants uh, are on safety committees, negotiating committees, uniform committees, that everybody participates, very democratic. So in, in reality, the line flight attendant can actually communicate with the president of the union. This, you know, through these committees, she can have her opinions taken right to the top. So we are the right arm of the president in these areas. And of course, where am I? I'm in California. I'm the West Coast representative, field service rep. Okay. And, my, and then I started going from, 
Los Angeles, to San Diego, to Honolulu, to Seattle, to Portland, to uh, Fresno, or San Francisco, and then Fresno, and then back to LA. And I would make this circuit every six weeks. And whatever the airlines in these different cities, there were always several of our carriers were based in these cities, I would service. I mean, if they needed support work for negotiations, I did that. They needed somebody to do training for employees assistance program, which was the drug and alcohol <laughs> and hmm. cracking up flight attendants. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we could we had ways of assisting them. And uh, and but whoever volunteered for these committees would have to be trained on how to do the job that they were volunteering for. And basically, that's what I did was the training, and I enjoyed that a lot. Did you? Yeah, I did that for two years, and then. I must have, you know, I like to joke around. And if I see a joke somewhere, I can't let it lie. I will pick it up and throw it out there. And I made some derogatory remarks about the then president of AFA, you know, which I thought were quite funny. They were terribly, terribly on point, though. And, you know, that is a bit of information. And somebody has that information, they will use it because it gives them a little oomph at that moment, <laughs> right? Sure. And so some of these remarks, I think, went back to the then president, and she called me into her office and said, I can't work with you. And I said, I beg your pardon? I'm doing top-notch work. They love me. They love me out in the West, <laughs> you know? I mean, Raina's, I, I, I just clicked with everybody. And she said, well, I can't work with you. But I said, I've always said good things about you, Susan. <laughs> She said, yes, and you've said some other things, too. I can't work with you. I'm terminating you. And, of course, we were just starting to form a union within the union, which I thought was, was funny. I said, oh, this is nuts that we're forming a union inside a union. Yeah, yeah, we're going to need it. I said, oh, no, that's bogus. You know, it's, I don't believe it. And there we go. Off so I that went. ended. What year was that? Uh, 89. 89. So I came back to the first time I'd ever been terminated from any yeah. job. Yeah. I mean... It was a shock. Yeah. And she had done it so well that she had done it on uh, was a, a Monday afternoon or something or a Tuesday afternoon. I had to wait a day for my final checks and expenses to be paid to me. So, and so I had to reappear in the office the day after I'd been kicked out. And that was just ugh, awful. Yeah. But that afternoon when she let me go at 5.30, of course I'm going back to the hotel. And I'm, I'm not in my, I, I got to my room and I called up room service and I said, two, vo two double vodkas and ice and hurry up. <laughs> and, and the phone starts ringing and it's the council chair people from the West Coast. And they're telling me what the hell went wrong. I mean, so her story was already there. <laughs> you know, whatever story she had said yeah. was already there. Had done her homework. And the, the only, the only uh, council person who might have had any political clout was the Seattle-based United Airlines girl, but she had been in union work and then left it, gone back to flying the line, and then returned to it. And she she didn't have the networking yet to to uh, put up some sort of a, a resistance. And she said, "It's just." She said, "But are you still coming up and doing the training for my grievance team?" And I said, "Who pays?" Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then the, the woman that they hired to replace me, who was from Alaska Airlines, we always had to be a flight attendant and so um, to work good. for AFA. That's good. And she called me up about three or four weeks later. She said, oh, I just got hired for your job. And she said, how do you do it? How do you do the job? And I said, Suzanne, yeah. I said, I love you, but I said, I can't. No I'm not going to do that. This is no crazy. Yeah. This is too cuckoo, yeah. you know. So anyhow, I had bunches of, uh, 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 what, uh, what do you call it? mileage plus things oh, from yes. all this flying that I had done. So I sent my parents uh, a couple of first class tickets and we met in Seattle and we toured British Columbia and had a grand old time and, and then I just didn't do anything for a year or so. And then by then we sold a house in Hermos Beach and we said we can't afford to buy a house in Hermos Beach, you know, 89, sure. yeah. Yeah. right? And so we said, well, let's go to the desert and see what there is there. Because we used to come down here for dinosaur and stuff. Sure. <laughs> and so we came down here 
and bought a place. In, in uh, 98. Uh, 89. 88. 89. And where'd you buy it? Where, uh, what, where? Palm Desert Greens. Okay. Yeah. You know, we're getting toward the end of this hour, and uh, <clears throat> probably going to have to go ahead and, uh, and change this, this tape. But now that I've got you here in California, it's a good place to just stop and take a break. For okay. A Do you uh, want to stand there? <laughs> All right. Or any such thing? All right. I have to get used to this uh. <laughs> as well. We kind of got away from World War II. <laughs> well, that's what we always do. That's what we always do now. If I well, I should have brought my New York Airways <laughs> album. <laughs> I think they're having a good time out there trying to get all those things. Now I have to try and figure out how this thing works. I think it's it's turned off now. And right. Now yeah, there you go. Right, right, right. That makes sense. Clever. Yes. These guys are always clever. How are you doing on time? Oh, I'm, I have nothing today. I was going to check a couple of my houses, but that's about it. Well, I, I want to get, I want to finish you up here without rushing you. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm okay. If I don't do it today, I'll do it tomorrow. No problem. This is not the uh, kind of studio that ordinarily one would. Oh. <laughs> Seems to work, no? It does, you yeah, know, it does. Yeah. the sound is great, the light is perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's just get this started. Okay, Rena. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes, Rena? yes. Rena, Rena, yes. Rena. Uh, <laughs> by the way, I love your uh, your uh, accent. Oh, thank you. When you do that, you know, I see Jaja <laughs> oh, all <yeah>. over, <laughs> in and out and around. The, <clears throat> the family um, has quite a, a, a number of different languages and accents to it. Uh, my father's sister, Helga, who married the ship's doctor and then got sent to England, of course, uh, she had two daughters, and they speak with absolutely British accents. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, the youngest sister, who had come to the United States with the parents and brother from Tanganyika, but she had she'd met a, a British Army man in, in Tanganyika. And after a couple of years working for Cook's Travel on Fifth Avenue, Meta went back to Africa and married uh, Barry Patterson, the, and who ended up in Kenya fighting the Mau Maus wow. during the uprising. And then after that, uh, left the military. He went to South Africa and was a general manager of some factory, something down there. And uh, they had two boys, uh, and then, of course, started this uh, with the independence of, you know, apartheid was coming to an end and all this. And the Cougarand, by the time Barry retired, the Cougarand was worth nothing overseas, so they yeah. just stayed. And then he's, he's passed away, and Meta's still alive. Her one son is a fantastically clever uh, computer man, hmm. electronics man, and he had a business in South Africa that he sold and made pots of money and then went to Australia and is busy making pots of money in Australia with my cousin Nigel. It's amazing. You're, um, <laughs> you're an only child. And yeah, you have so yeah. many uh, relatives yeah, and yeah, family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
from your folks on both sides, yeah, I yeah. suspect. Yeah, the, my mother's <coughs> side is, is difficult because uh, after World War II, they all uh, fell behind the Iron Curtain. Oh. So there was no communication for many years. I know we in the 50s, we would send parcels sure. over. You know, and like I would wear a dress for a certain period of time, and then before it got too worn out, uh, my auntie was in the garment industry as a designer. Uh, but before she became a designer, she was pattern maker and all this, and dressmaker and all this other stuff. So she would get the tags and then tag it as new because the Russians wanted only new things to be brought in, sent to the to the people there. And also, the there were was one brother and a sister that was left behind. Uh, two brothers, but one died during World War Two. And and this guy, he was also named George, my mother's brother in Czechoslovakia. And he was kind of a wheeler dealer, and he would take a lot of stuff and sell it on the black market and make money. <laughs> but he got himself somehow involved in the '56 Hungarian uprising. Oh, yes. With this, in I, I, th I think I heard CIA. I'm not sure, but the Russians got a hold of him, and off to Siberia he went for a visit of two or three years before he came home. I was on active duty at that time. <clears throat> in 56, 57, during the, quote, Hungarian situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. unquote. And um, I was uh, down uh, with the 1st Marine Division down at Camp Pendleton, and uh, we mobilized as much as we would have mobilized by setting up a uh, brigade, mm -hmm. just uh, setting up with the idea that all you had to do is bring the troops in yeah, to yeah, get another yeah. division up moving. But uh, we're called down to stand yeah, down yeah. Well, way before it got going. Well, so those the, little things that happen all over the world, even now, yeah, in this yeah, situation, yeah. is uh, is an important. Yeah. I want to. Uh, I got you to California. Okay. <laughs> and that's uh, that's. Well, that's now a it success. becomes it becomes disinteresting. Yeah, does it? <laughs> yeah, because I move out to the desert. I'm not doing anything. Uh, you know, I'm living on an allowance. You're not is, employed. You haven't been since. No, and nine. I don't. Ha and I don't have to be. You and know. You came out what year again? Uh, eighty nine. Eighty nine. So you've and been then, here a long time. In uh, yeah, then in nineteen Did you say that you came out with your roommate, by the way? Yeah, we we had shared a house, a duplex in Hermosa Beach, and we said, you know, let's sell, so, mm -hmm. and, and we can't afford here. to stay on the, in the South Bay. She was retiring from teaching, okay. and I was doing nothing, so desert's okay with me. We arrived in beginning of February. Oh, that and I, we didn't have the house in, in uh, Palm Desert Greens yet. We bought a place somewhere out in Thousand Palms, is it? Yeah, yes. Thousand Palms. And when we went to look, it was a new wobble box, I called it. <laughs> we went to look. And I was pacing out where the swimming pool would be put in. And I tripped on something, and I cleared the sand, and it was a manhole cover, middle of the backyard. And I said to the contractor, I said, well, what the heck is this? Well, you have the, uh, the access to the sewer system for, uh, palm de for a thousand palms. And I said, but we're building a pool here. Oh, no, you can't. Well, you didn't disclose that, you know. So we called up the escrow company and said, Ixnay this deal. This guy's a crook. You know, and got out of that one. Well, the moving truck is coming from Hermosa Beach, and we are homeless, <laughs> right? Good and so another friend, a chiropractor a friend said, she's got a place on white water <laughs> and Vista Chino. Okay? And you can stay there for as long as you want. Well, we went up there. It was a dump. <laughs> well, what it was was like it might might have been a miniature motel back in the forties or something. You know, it had like three little apartments, <laughs> and then somebody put in connecting doors and made it a house. <laughs> right. So I took three rooms, and as the moving truck was unloading, I said that box goes in that room, that box, and I made maps of where things were located in the boxes. So if we needed barbecue equipment, room two, aisle one, third box down fourth box in <laughs> and we call that the palazzo <laughs> uh -huh. and our answer machine was prego 
You have called the Natalie and the Reina at the Palazzo of Vincen Cinzan Cinzi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, We're out of riding the estate at the moment. Please leave the message. We will call you. And then the wind blew. Oh my God, the wind blew. And the sand. And I'm on the phone to a friend of mine back east. I said, I'm out in the backyard. I'm getting a face peel. <laughs> How long did you stay there then? <laughs> well, it didn't take us very long. Uh, I said, let's go to Morro Bay. I always uh, I liked it because yeah. I drove through it and yeah. it was a nice town. Yeah. I said, let's go to Morro Bay. And she said, what are we going to do in Morro Bay? I said, I have no idea. But I said, this is a horrible place. It's only nice when Dinah Shore is here. <laughs> I said, this was, a, this was a trick. I said, I'm not staying in this place. Crazy people live here. <laughs> this is insanity. And then a mutual friend of ours said, no, we have this very nice uh, proper uh, real estate agent. And... Uh, you should, you know, um, she's going to come over and visit with you. And, and Dorothy walked in just as I had discovered that the washer dryer was outside in the back and was full of sand, both of them. And I said, she said, you really are in a bad uh, yeah. location. And this is not the desert. This is not the typical desert. And I can show you lovely places. And I said, even that this thing exists is a sign. <laughs> <laughs> and Natalie's looking at me, she said, we can't drag the baby grand piano all over the world. <laughs> Who plays that? You? Natalie. She was music school teacher and she was a fantastic pianist. Beautiful. And she played in a couple of other clubs here in, in the Beautiful. desert and stuff like that. She played for Bob Hope one time. And her name is? Natalie Smith. Natalie Smith. Yeah. Dear, uh, dear friend just passed away two years ago, oh, November. Yeah. What a shame. Yeah, really. And she was from a, a very proper family. Her father and my father, I mean, Bob Smith was an American, but they were the same sweater, the same, sh the same way of the proper shirt with the proper pants with the proper shoes, mm -hmm. and girls don't do that. We were raised by the same man, only with different accents. Yeah. You know? And she, he was the chairman of Sealright Corporation, uh, the makers of the milk containers. Oh. You know? And they were... They were, uh, you know, uh, what was they lived in Glendale House. She went to UCLA. Mm -hmm. I have a fantastic story. She was a junior high school music teacher. And she graduated from UCLA early 50s and was assigned to Watts. And her father said, I have connections. I'm getting you out of there. And she said, no, you're not. I go where they tell me to go, and I'm going to Watts. And she walked into that class, and she said, the way I play the piano is different from the way you guys play the piano. I want to hear your music. And they just thought Miss Smith was the coolest lady on campus. Mm. These junior high school kids. Yeah. And she, her father gave her a Buick convertible right, <laughs> as a graduation present. And her car was untouched <laughs> versus the other yeah, teachers. Me, me. You know? They just thought Nat Smith was great. So her principal... Uh, fell in love with her too, thought she was great. So when he got assigned to open up Marina Del Rey Junior High School, he took a couple of his favorite teachers with him and that was one of them. And she taught music and the, the class was tiered seating like in a theater and then the baby grand piano there and then her record player and stuff and, and she taught these little kids music. And then uh, Towards the late 80s, the electives, music and all this other stuff was being put aside and the kids need to learn. Yeah. They're not learning the essentials. So Nat went back to school, to college, and upgraded her, her minor credential of English so that she could teach it. But they kept her in the music room. So when classes changed, that was the seventh graders, when the classes changed, she would sit at this piano and it was beat up old ugly thing but had a tone that was beautiful and she would sit down at the piano and play music while the kids left and the other ones entered and this little black boy comes over and he's st he's standing over and he's watching her hands you know and just watching what she's doing and all this and finally the class is all settled and she stops to play and this little kid says to her miss smith why don't you get a real job and she said doing what well you know, playing at Nordstrom's. Because <laughs> <laughs> school is yeah. not a real place. Yeah, no, you know, it's a holding pen. You know? <laughs> sure. 
Sure. <laughs> That's my favorite Nightsmith story. That is cute. <laughs> well, then you say you were quite f friends with her. Oh, Good yes. Friends. Yes, yes, like yes. Very close. Yes, yeah. Very yeah, sweet. and the family's got to, uh, you know, sweet, they, yeah. they met a couple of times. And, yeah, and they, she's been gone now for a while. Yeah, two years. Two years. Are you living... Yeah. In the same place now? No, I have a little house up in Cathedral uh, City Cove, Cathedral okay. Canyon Cove. Yeah. Uh, the, what's the what street address? Paradise. Oh, 39020 Paradise Way. Paradise Way. Cathedral City. Cathedral City. Nine yeah. two. Two, th nine two two three four. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Good, and you like yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, happy. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a roommate now? Yes, I do. Yes, she is the. Um, uh, Manager of security for Fantasy Springs. Oh. She doesn't tell any stories. <laughs> Everything is a secret. And she's from North Dakota. They don't talk anyhow. So <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah, you betcha. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I said, so what happened to the casino today? Nothing. <laughs> so what, of course. Uh, what do you do uh, now, uh, if I may, what do you do for, uh, for uh, relaxation? Uh, what do you do for I fun? Try to, find, fun? try to find the time. Uh, Right. I don't sit quietly. This is unusual that I sit so, such a long time. Okay. Um, all right, let, let me take you to, so uh, 89 we moved down here and then we, this realtor found us a place in the Palm Desert Greens. You know, and that was a, she loved golfing and I don't know anything mm -hmm. about it. And I like the golf cart, that was fun. But, uh, and then I'm, so what am I doing? I'm cooking and I'm playing in the garden. And oh, I had to go back to Florida. My mother was diagnosed with uh, hmm. with uh, bone cancer. Now, in 1953, my mother had been diagnosed with lupus, and they said to my father, "She won't live beyond 1964." Well, she lived yeah. well beyond, and we we think it is because she started to travel with my father, and they lived mostly in hotels, so she had a quiet life. Hmm. And he didn't always tell her if business was not good or if they mm -hmm. were on shaky ground, he wouldn't let her know. Everything was always yeah. excellent. Yeah. So he kept her, her nerves, <laughs> you know. Although she said, it cannot everything school be so good all the time. Sometimes you have to have the trouble. <laughs> but no, you know, so. And so she had an easy life uh, comparatively, other than that, that they moved constantly. You know, and she never, sure. she her, her big uh, loss in, uh, was that the, the group of friends, you know, you make friends and then three yep. years later you're you're on your way somewhere else. But she said, you have to take the good with the bad, so. And the important. older you get, the more difficult it is to acquire yeah, new yeah. ones. Not that one. She, no problem. <laughs> this one never met a stranger. <laughs> Did she perform at all uh, no. in small little groups or whatever? No, 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 no. No, that was kind of like, you know, oh, well, Another life. small, small, a small time in life. She loved to talk about it. But he he was like you know well it's just it was only for a short period because in her in her uh, obituary I said put that she was in show business you know during World War Two that was such a small part of her life oh, so it didn't go oh. in but um, anyway uh, where was I uh, you were talking about uh, oh so what I'm uh, what I'm up to yeah so. Uh, she uh, diagnosed with the bone cancer in, in uh, Christmas Eve. As a matter of fact, I called, I called up to, to because we celebrated Christmas Eve, to call up uh, to wish him Christmas Eve. And, and my father said, "Oh, your mother did something with her back, and she can't even get out of the bed. She's in so much pain." Oh no, this is something, you know, because that won't. The, my mother never complained about any pain, nothing. And then she had rheumatoid arthritis. Never peeped. She walked all over Bangkok like nobody's business. And strong little, strong little person, and uh, so I thought, wow, well that's really. I said, well, what are you going to do about it? No, well, after I finish talking to you, I'm going to call the doctor. And the doctor said, I find out later on. The doctor said, you take. She was standing at the kitchen sink, and something happened, and she had tremendous pain and couldn't stand up. So they took her to the hospital, and they uh, into the emergency room, so on and so forth. They admitted her. And then two days later, a doctor walked in the room, someone my father had never seen before in his life, and he said, well, Mr. Schulten, you know what we have here, cancer, bone cancer, and she's on uh, limited time. And the guy walked out. And my father called, and it's the first time in my life I ever heard that his voice cracks. And he said, you have to come. Yeah. He said, I don't know what to do, you have to come. And so 
I jumped on the airplane and went down there. And uh, she firstly, she was in the, when I arrived, she was still in the orthopedic ward. And uh, a doc, our their regular doctor walked in and he said, uh, "Okay, it's it is confirmed. She has bone cancer." And she's going to move from the orthopedic ward. She's going to go up to oncology. And of course, the three of us broke down crying. And my mother sat in that big bed, that little lady, and she said, Basta. She said, what are we complaining about? She said, I should have been dead in 1964. And here I am in 1992. She said, I lived on borrowed time for 30 years. Sure, we right. have nothing yeah. to complain. And up to oncology we go. And so a couple of, you know, course I'm things are happening and days go by and the doctor walks in and said we're going to do chemo and we're going to do x-ray treatment and my mother said no she said I'm living on borrowed time and it's my time to go I go mm. and he said Mrs. Sh uh, Scholten it's not to save your life it's to control the pain and she said okay doctor to control the pain yes but you make me to live one day longer than I should I will come back and ghost you. <laughs> and three months, they said, right? they diagnosed three three to six months and exactly Was it primary months. in the bone? From head to toe. And they had been, uh, the doctors had been treating her for osteosporosis for a year. Yeah. And all with the lupus, because she took prednisone. First it was cortisone. Oh, yeah. Touch wood that she reacted to all these medications very well. And she stayed out of the sun, and you know, yeah. unfortunately, yeah, my father's business was in the tropics. Yeah. So, you know, and my dad, when my mother hit 40, he said, I want the sleeves down to here. I don't want to see this loose skin, and I don't want to see the neck covered to here. So, so she's in the tropics covered from head to toe, and she had very, very fine blonde hair. So, when she perspired, the hairdo collapsed. Yeah. So, she would make turbans for herself. and. I mean, she was so unique looking there in the in the heat where everybody else is half naked. Yeah. You know, here she comes. <laughs> like a lady. Yeah. And very, very, uh, the skin very, very white. And uh, the ties, when we walked down the street, well, sometimes she wore a sleeve down to here, you know. I mean, her, her yeah. arms were uh, exposed. And because of her white skin, as we walked down the streets in Bangkok, the ties would touch her, you know. And the first time it happened, I said, I kind of like, what the heck? And then it happened again, and repeatedly. And I said, what goes on with these people? What is their problem? She said, Renushka, because I am so white, they think I bring good luck if they touch me. She said, it's okay, let them. Yeah, sweet, <laughs> sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what year was that that she passed away? Uh, it was the March of 93. Uh, 93, in Florida. In Florida, in Clearwater. In Clearwater. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I have to tell you. Where is she buried? Uh, 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 at sea. They, the, they both uh, uh, wanted cremation. Your father was still living. Yes, he lived another ten years. Was was he much older than your mother? Uh, a year, year and a half. Just a year. Yeah, yeah. So he kept in pretty good condition and in shape. Yeah, too, didn't yeah, he? yeah, yeah. No, he was, he was comparatively healthy. Um, you know, took some cholesterol pills and was yeah. maybe I think he had angina or something. How old was your mother at her time of her death? 1975. Oh, and that's another remark of hers, because she knew she was dying. How old, how old was she at the time? 1970. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, she was 75 years old. 75 years yeah, old. Yeah, 75 years old. And, and, and she knew she was dying. Yeah. I mean, my yeah, father sure. said, we're, we're not going to tell her. And I said, that's not fair. Yeah. This is not correct, you know. Maybe she has something yeah. to say or do before she goes. No, I don't want her to know. And, well, the woman has ESP. You know? Yeah. <laughs> She's... Every woman has. You're not going to fool <laughs> this one. And uh, she said, Erwinsko, I'm not going to make it out of this one. Oh, Marge, are you nonsense. You know, well, you could tell on our faces that, no, you're not going to make it. And I was kind of, I didn't want her not to know. So, you know, yeah. she, could, she could tell. And one day she woke up from the morphine, and she looked at me, and she said, Renushka, this is not the day I planned it. She said, you know, the bastards. Now, she used certain words in English that were not good. And my father always said, think of it in Russian first and then say it. It's a terrible word. She said, then, yeah, the bastards. That was her word for men. She said, the bastards, they always die before us, you know? So your father was to precede me. 
then I was going to go on a cruise with my Milltown and my vodka and have a, oh, and a bottle of champagne, go to the back of the boat, eat my Milltown, drink my, my champagne, and jump overboard. You don't even have a body to bury. <laughs> that was the plan. But the God, he interfered. <laughs> Yeah. And then, and I said, "Oh, Mumsy, don't don't talk like that, you know." <laughs> or we kind of it was funny, so I laughed. And she said, "You know, the one good thing is I still look good, so you will always remember me as looking very good, not an old lady." <laughs> and she did. <laughs> and she did. Isn't that nice? Yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful story, a beautiful story about <laughs> you and your mom. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. should be written up. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad we can talk about that. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. You your know, dad lived on for a while? Another 10 years. Down there? Uh, Alone? No, he, he didn't want to stay. He said, you know, she's all over the place down here. And he said, it's not, for him it was uncomfortable for some reason. And I said, well, they say you shouldn't do anything the first year. You know, you, yeah. you need to adjust to what has happened. And he said, if you don't mind, he said, I'd like to come to California and I promise not to hang on your neck. And I said, well, you know, I know you're not going to hang on my neck, for heaven's sakes, you know. So I, I, we, transported some stuff through UPS and then there were certain certain things that they had collected from around the world that he didn't want shipped. So we we hired a U-Haul and I packed it. I packed everything. You it won't fit. And Natalie said, "Does he ever stop?" And I said, "It's okay, no problem. I'm used to it, you know." You can't make that go in. That's enough. That's enough. There's you have too much in there already. I said, mm -hmm. One more thing, pups. <laughs> <laughs> and then we drove across. Well, you go up uh, Highway 19, connect to 10, turn left, and stop in Palm Springs. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And Texas is endless. Yeah. yeah. No, that's true. <laughs> oh my that's God! True. You just keep going. Texas. We're still in Texas. We're still in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> but did you have enough room in your place? To put all these. Well, he, yeah. yeah uh, or, well, we had a huge. We had we had a huge garage. So the when the stuff arrived, it went to the garage. Uh, and he didn't bother with the furniture. He left the place furnished, and and it was a he bought, it was uh, he outright owned the condominium. I see. So he gave yeah. it to a realtor to sell. And I said, you ought to hang around. You know, these guys are crooks, especially Florida. Doesn't have rules. You know. And he goes, no, no, he's an honest. My father was a dead honest man. Yeah. Very honorable man. And the stockbroker didn't do him any favors. Oh, <laughs> the realtor sold it for half what he paid for it. I mean, it yeah, just. That's true. But, oh well, you know, what can you do? He didn't want to stay, he didn't want to, it's all right, don't worry about it, I don't, so. And then when he came here, where did he live? He went to the Hacienda de Monterey. He stayed uh, with Matt and I for about uh, three uh, weeks or so. And during that time was touring around, we went to all the retirement homes. And then he said, this Hacienda de Monterey, because it has a wind. It has a, uh, It's on the second floor, top floor, and it has a little balcony. And there's a tree right there. So a view. That was mm -hmm. perfect. So he wanted his tree there. So. <laughs> and he had three meals a day, and he tipped the staff, all contrary to the rules and regulation. And I said, it's forbidden, you know. He said, it's forbidden in a lot of places. And he said, and I always tip, and I always get the best of service, don't I? But he would not be called Irwin by a young kid. The, you know, the waitresses and waiters, they were like college kids or yeah. something, or high school kids. And there's this first name, you know, everybody calls them each other by their first names. And they say, hi, Irwin, and he goes, I'm Mr. Scholten, please. And that was Mr. Scholten for the next yeah. 10 years. The old school. Yeah, yeah. There was a nobility yeah. and a class yeah. to those folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No question about that. Yeah. And the, he's a kind man. We left Africa, when we left Africa, the, the head houseboy in the house, there were 10 guys who served. And uh, he said, he went to him and he said, what is your wish in life, your dream? And he said, I would like to have a, a little farm. And my father bought him the little farm yeah. and settled him down before we left. So as much as he was bossy with the natives, but I don't know. Maybe maybe it required they required that uh, you know. Uh, there had to be a, a balance. Little, a strict, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so that they knew there's a. Is uh, your father is not living now? No, he passed away in two thousand and three, in June. 
uh, right here. In, in the uh, desert, in the yes. Desert. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, he was lymphoma. Oh, yeah. Dr. George uh, got him into a remission one time, and then Dr. George got was killed on this highway accident, you know, this oncologist guy? He's from India. And my father w it, had, knew exactly wh what village yeah, he came right. from. Oh, they used to talk about India. And uh, and he, he took chemo, and, he, and he, he came through the first time, and he was in remission for a couple of years. And then, even worse than that, his eyesight went. A, a, a <coughs> very aggressive, wet macular degeneration, oh, you know? And all he did was read. My mother used to complain, you know, he doesn't talk to me, he reads his books. Or he collects his, his coins. But he doesn't talk to me, this man. <laughs> and I think my father under his breath said, you talk enough for both of us. <laughs> You've taught the kid to do the same thing. <laughs> How old was he when he passed away? Uh, 89. 89. Mm -hmm. And his twin brother still lives. He's in Miami. Oh, he does. Yeah, and he survived you still, you throat still, cancer. You still uh, talk to him and correspond on occasion, with everybody? On occasion. There's a little family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bernard is a very, very uh, controlling, forceful kind of fellow, and he would like me to come to Miami and take care of him. My mother said, "No, yeah. this is don't don't ever get yourself into this thing." She said, "You you have enough with your parents. You don't have to take care of everybody." And she didn't care for him anyhow. <laughs> and one, you know, there is. There are certain enfamies, things inside the family, you know, that uh, little things that leak out sure, that you, of course. you you know that. Uh, yeah. Right, let it be. When are you coming to Florida? Yeah, I'll come see you. You know, and then I get down there. As well, you can work down here. You can find work down here. I said, I'm not living in your little yeah. itty bitty den on a pull out sofa and take care of you. Know, you have people. <laughs> you know, you've had such a great career and I just sit and listen to you and amazed at the <coughs> what you've accomplished and where you've mm. gone and come from. Um, I wonder whether you have thought about what is it that you've received from your upbringing and where you were brought up and all these experiences mm. that gave you the drive to do what you have done, accomplish what you have accomplished? All right. Uh, when I read my uncle's story, their father uh, insisted that they do well in school. The, the sisters of my grandfather, uh, because they were subsidized by my grandfather the, and the husbands were given businesses to play around in, the, uh, their kids were spoiled. If they didn't do well in school, eh, no big deal. You know? the, my father and his twin, this grade is not was a, what was expected. We are now getting a tutor, and you're going to hit the books. My father, although he had this Victorian attitude of, Raina is a girl, she will go to college, and this is where she will meet her husband, and she will marry, and she will be taken care of for the rest of her life by her husband. That's the way it works. And unfortunately, he had a rebel on his hands. I, 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 uh, too much of an independent streak. I don't know where that, what, maybe that comes from my mother, this independence, to stand up and not be afraid of the world and to, to want to do stuff. But to want to do it correctly, I think, comes from my dad. So there's a, a very nice blend the of, the, of the two. Uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I have, I, I, uh, my mother also uh, had, had uh, they both were very honorable people. No, it, it, there was no crookedness, no, there was no necessity to lie as a child. If I, if I did something wrong, you just tell us that you've done something wrong and, you know, we will explain to you why you shouldn't have done this thing. But it wasn't that I was I was never punished in any terrible way. Things were explained. <laughs> My mother could explain for hours, <laughs> you know? And it was like, I'd rather take a beating than to have to listen to this, you know? <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, and, I, and I, I also was raised to try to please. I knew I should try to please my parents. And maybe it, it goes, uh, I go a little bit too far, 
because what has happened uh, since my mother passed and then my father uh, came out here and then uh, Nat wanted to go to Oregon and I said I'm not going to Oregon I don't want to go you know what's up there and then I t to move him again no I'm just gonna settle down in the desert and then it got to well I need to find work but well, not too many helicopter airlines around here not too many unions <laughs> okay so what do you do yeah. you you have taken care of people most of your life yeah. Yeah. right uh, one form or another so security and I so naive when walked into the security company and said I would like to work for you you know thinking that everything was going to be on the up and up these are the biggest crooks in the world <laughs> you know? don't tell me that <laughs> But there's a lot of shifty stuff going on in the security business. Not not the employee himself. The security guard, no. God bless him. In spite of some really uh, uh, difficult, uh, you know, circumstances, he does his job to the best of his ability. Anyhow, I joined Guards Mark <laughs> and worked for them for 15 years. I just retired a couple of years. Yeah. I, yeah uh, bleh, when was it? Six, uh, 2008. Uh, 2009? No, 2000, no, 2007 because I have one. No, 2008 because the, we just passed the one year la uh, on, in nine. And I, I uh, first was assigned to driving patrol from 9 o'clock at night to 5.30 in the morning in a gas-operated golf cart and outdoor resorts on Date Palm and Ramon. <laughs> Again, the luck. I'm working with three former Marines. And note that I used the correct former Marine, <laughs> right? Gunny Sergeant Sears, Gunny Sergeant Dell, retired, 20-year uh, men. And uh, uh, the other Marine was a guy by the name of Tyrone, who was in tanks in Desert uh, Storm. Storm. Yeah. Sure. He said, they always said, we were FedExed into the war, because they, they, yeah. they flew them in on FedEx. Yeah. And they said, when that thing loaded and the ramp went down, he said, lock and load, we were ready, you know. And, uh, oh, nice men. <laughs> they, Thank they were you. a little bit naughty, but nice. They were, And they took very good care of me, especially since it was nighttime. That's a Marine way. Yes. But, you know, I'm also equal. So if I'm supposed to drive that, that crummy uh, <laughs> little yeah. golf cart and it's, you know, the sprinklers are blowing water on me and the wind is coming and it's it's four, 39 degrees out there, you know, while I'm in the street and I'm shivering, never mind. She's got to do her two hours, you know. Did you have any exciting times uh, when you were in that job? <laughs> only t only because I was, I scared myself <laughs> oh. in the middle of the night. Have you have you been inside this outdoor resorts? This no, is, I have not. It's, it is 1,230 lots for these motorhomes, and they're all Class A motorhomes, right? They're not uh, fifth wheels or anything like that. They are these is big... Is that the one that has a small golf course in there? Too? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I have been there. I have a friend that... Oh, I made myself into place. trouble one day. Uh, in the middle of... The, oh, anyhow, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I show up there at, at uh, 9 o'clock at night, my, you know, my first day on duty, and you're not to come before 15 minutes before schedule, and you're not supposed to stay longer than 15 minutes after your schedule, you know, and I'm, I'm following all the rules and regulations, these guys are going to relax. <laughs> but, so I start, they give me a map, it's pitch black, right? And I'm driving around through all these, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable streets, and I'm, and I'm getting myself all turned around, and then finally I said, stupid, the tram light, that's always in the same place. This is your point of reference, and that's how I learned my way around outdoor resorts in the middle of the night. Did that from uh, September till January, and then they, they moved me to a schedule 1.30 in the afternoon till 9.30 at night, right? Five days a week? Yeah, 40-hour day, uh, eight-hour day, 40 Sometimes hours. on the weekends? Oh, yes, yeah. rotating, rotating, all sorts of things. So, And, and I said, I'm used to shift work, you know, I always did funny hours and uh, so I show up for work at 1.30 in the afternoon this is the first time I see this place in broad daylight it's a lot smaller in the daylight than it is at night your mind you know sure. and so I'm driving around and of course I see the golf course for the first time and it's all little par threes <laughs> and I you know because like I said you know I love a joke and I can't stop myself when I see one so I pick up the radio and I radio back to the gatehouse. I said, 
when are they putting up the castles and the windmills? Because <laughs> it's so little. <laughs> the manager has a radio in his office. <laughs> and he listens to us talking to each other, <laughs> right? And the, uh, of course, the Marines taught me to talk in numbers. But this one, yeah, how do you put a windmill in a number? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Sears radios back, he said 1020, I mean 1019. 1019 means come back to the gatehouse. So I skedaddled my little, it's governed at eight miles an hour, by the way. And I was in hot pursuit of a Ferrari one day who blew a stoplight. <laughs> Stop sign. You know? I'm there like this, <laughs> trying to make it go faster. <laughs> so I go back to the gatehouse and Sears says, don't. He said, watch yourself on the radio. This manager listens to us 24-7. You know, I went, oh, oh. <laughs> but um, so I did that. And then uh, and then I was transferred to other uh, country clubs. I went to Woodhaven for a <laughs> while. And then finally one day they said, we're sending you to Thunderbird Country Club. Do not bring up your Jewish background. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, well, you sit at the gatehouse, nobody talks to you at the country, because yeah. I'm yeah. guarding the clubhouse yeah. and the golf course. And uh, the only thing is get that arm up as fast as you can the moment you see them, you know, because they're busy. And they don't, it's a suit. Yeah. They don't know, it's a man, woman, or who's standing there, okay. you know. But there was one gentleman, and he had a Marine sticker on his car. So when he would come up, and he had a, the, I recognize his license plate, and whenever he drove in, I always gave him this, you know, and he saluted me back. Four, four years later, uh, I'm assigned. They're opening up the gatehouse at Thunderbird Terrace, which is one of the seven gates around Thunderbird Country Club. There are 48 homes in there, and some of them are country club members and some of them, no, you know. And so we open up the gate, and here comes the Marine. <laughs> He's a retired, uh, an yeah. elderly gentleman. And he pulls up to the gatehouse, and. And I'm like this, you know, and he's, he salutes me back, and he uh, rolls the window down. He said, I'm Roger Rice, and what's your name? I said, God, I've been saluting you for four years. <laughs> I said, my name is Raina. And he said, well, we're very happy to have real guards in this gatehouse instead of just a telephone. I said, oh, well, thank you so much, you know. And... Uh, and all these homeowners are doing the same thing. They're pulling up to the gate, they're stopping, they're introducing themselves. Yeah, nice. You know, and I said, what the heck is this? You know, over there, they couldn't have identified me in a mugshot yeah. for nothing. We're guarding their home. Not some place where they go to play. Yeah. This yeah. is their home. Yeah. And they really treated us as a member of the household staff, oh, yeah. not some, en some little entity in a box out there. It's all the difference. I mean, did you enjoy your day off, you know? How are things going? Is your dad okay? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Beautiful. the nicest group of people, really, really proper, nice people. That's beautiful. Yeah. And then from there, uh, the first supervisor was a, was a British gentleman, Frankie Bancroft. He had been the manager of air freight for Pan Am at Heathrow. Well, so we meet, you know, we're in crew change time, we are chatting. And somehow aviation came up, and he goes, I was with Pan Am. I said, I was with New York Airways. Well, we owned you. I said, no, you own 49% of our stock. <laughs> you know? And, well, do you know so-and-so? And I said, yeah, and do you know so-and-so? Yeah. Aviation is, again, this, the small... A common denominator. Yeah, yeah. And, but, and it's a small community. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. If you don't know that person, you know somebody yeah. who does know yeah. him. And so, and Frank... Uh, he was just doing this because he was getting a divorce and he didn't. He wanted to stay out of the house. And uh, when the divorce finalized, then he moved to uh, somewhere around Phoenix, uh, Gold Valley or something like that. And we're still we still uh, exchange cards and talk to each other. He'll call me up every once in a while. Hello, love. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> and as I'm, I became, then I was supervisor of this gatehouse. And then uh, about five years after I was there, this Roger Rice comes to me and he said, you know, we go away for the summer. And I said, yeah, half this place goes away. And it's like 15 houses are, yeah. are still occupied and the rest of them place. are emptied out. And he said, well, we've always had somebody check our house, you know, for leaks and things like that. Perfect. But the guy just up and quit us. Would you like to do that? And we'll pay you what we pay him. And I said, sure. You know, lovely. 
and you know I can I I usually I always work the afternoon shift I like it first of all at Thunderbird it's the social hour so you really are you're more exposed to the homeowner and their mm -hmm. guests sure. and everybody's happy yeah yeah and uh, so in the morning I would check the house and then I would come in to work in the afternoon and then I checked it three days a week and then the word got around you know she's really very precise and so on and so forth and more and more I finally ended up with 15 houses the the uh, the year before I quit guards mark um, so I'm doing the houses and then my friend Natalie up in Oregon she's got lung cancer and she went into remission and then then it got, the chemo was killing her so she quit the chemo and then they said well she's only got till April and I said all right Here's, here's what I'm going to do, Natalie. I said, I'm going to retire from Guards Mark. I'm going to start my Social Security because I was within range. And my previous jobs, I have a, a, what I think is fairly decent Social Security. You know, I can live. And, and I'm going to come up and take care of you and take you to your final exit, you know. So that's what Sweet. I did. And then when I came back, of course, everybody was concerned. Are you going to be able to take care of our house this summer? And I said, trust me, <laughs> no problems, you know. And so Nat, Nat passed, and then I returned, and and I so now I'm on Social Security, but I've have I have the houses in the summertime, and then, but little by little, they said, well, Raina's you know Raina's retired; she's not doing anything. Why don't you ask her to do this? So Mrs. Hunter goes away for a couple of you know a day or two. Can you sit the dog? I sit the dog. So you're busy again. All of a sudden, I have a business concern and I'm now giving up the houses because it's brutal to go in to 15 houses three times a week in this miserable summer that we have you know and they said well we'll leave the air and I said it's not that I'm in your house 15 minutes maybe tops you know but I mean I'm walking around the outside of the house looking mm -hmm. for leaks I'm trying to break into the house to make sure it's secure and then I'm getting into my hot car and going on to the next one I said my tongue is uh, on the floor yeah. by the time I get home and I said you know, every year I get a little older, so uh, I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of letting some of, some of the clients go, maybe keeping five houses. Good for you. But two guys who used to live at Thunderbird Terrace have moved to Bighorn, and they have two Wheaton Terriers. Last uh, this last December on the twentieth, can you come and stay with the Wheatons for eight days while we go back to New York? Okay, <laughs> I know. Kyle and Sophie, and there's a dog park up in in uh, Bighorn, so that's you know you walk. I I I uh, the bigger dogs I exercise a great deal, and I've had I've had a connection with animals because of I think because maybe I was isolated in Africa or something, so there's a I have a rapport with an animal, and so anyhow go up there and stay with the Wheatons and I go to the doggy park, well. My name's Albert, what's yours? And I don't want them to think I'm a homeowner. So I said, I'm right now, I'm the dog walker <laughs> and dog sitter. Oh, well, do you have a card? Because we go out of town. <laughs> Here's my card. <laughs> so since December, the, the doggy business has come up. I, stu I, I The two guys came back the 28th of February. Uh, the 29th of February, I'm already with Boris. <laughs> Boris the dog for 17 days. So I've just come off of that. <laughs> what an interesting idea. Just keep, I, I don't know, you keep, just keep I, on doing it. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. And you're still doing that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, this is, this is business this now. Is it. Yeah, I st I'm still watching three houses from last, well, the one, the one couple left late in August. And they said, can you take us to the airport, Raina? And I said, sure. And they said, okay, uh, the airplane's going to go at a quarter to eight, so pick us up at 7.15. And I said, you know, Mr. Samus, I said, you're cutting it a little bit close, aren't you, with security and everything? He goes, it's our airplane right now. It goes when we go. I went, oh, oh of course. <laughs> well, Raina, uh, I'm going to have to uh, cut this kind of close here shortly. Yeah, yeah. I do want to ask you one, one more thing, though, that... <clears throat> That I think, uh, number one, it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you. Your personality and such is just a winning way. Well, thank you. I'm not surprised you. that you go from <laughs> one to the other and are still going. But what, what kind of advice would you give to a young uh, girl 
who comes to this country from another land, not knowing English, what kind of advice would you give her on the, as she gets off the plane or off the boat, as the case may be, and to what to expect from your experience? America is an extremely, Americans are extremely kind people. Even, even after all the, the nonsense that we've taken over the last few years, you know, that we're hated around the world, uh, I think the, uh, Amer the average American is extremely kind, very generous people. I, had, I saw this situation at, at Thunderbird Terrace that you described. There's a, a au pair who was brought in from Germany to, to uh, help out in, in the household with grandchildren and stuff. And the girl could barely speak, in, uh, speak English. And these people turned themselves inside out to, to communicate with her and to try to show her things and to make her comfortable. You know, and I said, "There we are. That's 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 what we are. Mm -hmm. Just super. Don't be don't be frightened in this country. Don't because I, it's mostly kind. Uh, really kind. It's so giving. You no, know? mm -hmm. very we're very generous people. Look what happens in Haiti, right? We have our own financial woes and our own troubles in this country, but." Who the heck is expected to go down and help these people? It's the Americans, and and we and we do it. Yeah.